Officially like to call this uh, hearing to order. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. We are fortunate to have what is truly an all-star panel of witnesses with us today, and I would first like to express my appreciation to each of you for taking the time from your schedules during an extraordinary difficult period to be with us this morning. We are joined by the heads of four of our major federal law enforcement agencies. Admiral James Loy, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, Commissioner Robert Bonner of the U.S. Customs Service, Commissioner James Ziegler of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and Administrator Asa Hutchinson of the Drug Enforcement Administration. We'll also hear from Mr. Frank Gallagher of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. September 11th terrorist attacks prompted the initiation of the largest criminal investigation in American history, as well as extraordinary efforts by the federal government to prevent future incidents and secure American borders, citizens, and infrastructure. I want to recognize the truly exhaustive work that each of your agencies has done under the most difficult circumstances to protect our nation. We thank you and your personnel and support you fully in these endeavors and in the many challenges which the current situation continues to pose on a daily basis. The focus of our hearing today is the equally extraordinary demands which have now been placed on federal law enforcement to simultaneously deal with your day-to-day -day missions, such as drug interdiction, criminal investigations, and enforcement of many laws which each of you have been charged to oversee. Several agencies have greatly increased work hours for their employees and redeployed a significant proportion of their assets to homeland security. But the issue for us is not homeland security. As a subcommittee responsible for oversight of our justice system, the question for us quickly becomes what is left and what now needs to be done. It has been widely acknowledged that additional funding and planning are necessary to reinforce the execution of traditional law enforcement missions in addition to Homeland Security. But this is not a simple question of simply providing more resources. We must consider how best and most realistically to cope with the changing and rapidly increasing demands on federal law enforcement agencies. As an example, our ongoing series of oversight hearings on border security have suggested that it is not enough simply to provide funding for more Border Patrol agents. We must resolve tough questions as to where we will recruit such agents, how quickly we will train them, and what the resulting impact will be on the, uh, on the places from which these new agents will be taken. As another example, we are robbing Peter to pay Paul when we reinforce our airline security by taking agents from the FBI, DEA, and Customs Service. Short-term necessary evils ultimately will not stand in the stead of adequate medium and long-term planning. We also need to ensure that the end result of the long-term planning with which all of our government is being forced to do at lightning speed does not overcompensate for any one problem. Members of Congress and others have proposed or discussed merging functions from several current law enforcement agencies into a single new agency with responsibility for protection of the homeland. If such a process were to take place, it must, it must recognize the equal importance of other missions carried out by these agencies. The Coast Guard, for example, must continue to be strongly supported in its efforts to save lives through search and rescue operations, protect the environment, and interdict drugs. Our hearing will examine three primary issues. First, what has been the immediate impact of the redeployment on law enforcement assets on critical areas such as drug addiction and other criminal enforcement? Second, what is the current status of long-term planning within federal agencies to ensure the continuation of vigorous law enforcement while simultaneously addressing the additional demands of Homeland Security? Third, what impact would proposals to consolidate certain functions into a new agency have on the ability of existing agencies to carry out their conventional missions? Fortunately, as we discussed at a Drugs and Terrorism Conference at DEA yesterday, some of these efforts have a synergistic effect. Cracking down on terrorism will also facilitate the accomplishment of other missions. For example, at Gander, Newfoundland, when passengers grounded on 9-11 had all bags searched, large quantities of the drug ecstasy were found. Other overlapping examples will include tracking illegal immigrants and in intelligence operations, money laundering, and other new laws which will help other, catch other criminals as well as ter potential terrorists. Again, my thanks to all the witnesses. We look forward very much to the opportunity to discuss each of these issues with such a distinguished panel. Now I'd like to yield to Mrs. Schakowsky. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to uh, this incredible panel of people who have come to uh, answer some of the questions and concerns that the Chairman has outlined. Um, the hearing today is to discuss two matters, the impact of the new, foci the new focus on Homeland Security is having on our law enforcement agencies and the possible consolidation of existing law enfor enforcement agencies to create a single Homeland Security Agency. Given the new demands, our law enforcement agencies and officers have risen to the increased workload since the terrorist attacks of the 11th of September. I commend our law enforcement and security personnel for the time and effort they have made and continue to make for our protection. Since the attacks on September 11th, the nation has been struggling to understand and adapt to a new reality. We're creating new tools and organizational structures to appropriately fit our security needs. In this process, we must be careful. We must ensure that these agencies, agencies are adequately funded to accomplish their original missions in addition to the new and critical mission of national security. We must have collaboration among the law enforcement agencies, and we must evaluate proposals for new agency structures. Yet in all of this, it is essential, too, that we not lose sight of the principles and freedoms that we hold dear, most dear, as Americans. The safety of our nation and our residents is a critical priority, and we must do whatever is necessary to ensure homeland security. At the same time, it's important that agencies with multiple missions like the Immigration and Naturalization Service, pay careful attention to appropriately balancing enforcement with the other services they provide. This will be a particular challenge for the INS, and I'm interested to hear more about the plan to restructure the agency. I also encourage my colleagues in this committee to continue to monitor both aspects of this agency's mission. I am also, as the chairman is, concerned about the diversion from conventional federal law enforcement functions as a result of the sudden and unanticipated reallocation of resources. I'm concerned with many of the recent law enforcement efforts surrounding this investigation and the general efforts to strengthening the fight against terrorism. I want to emphasize while I firmly believe we need to stop terrorists here and abroad, and as we make structural and policy adjustments to do this, that we have to uphold the Constitution and the civil rights and civil liberties inscribed in it. I have a few questions and look forward to engaging in a worthwhile discussion with the witnesses on the subject today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Before proceeding, I would like to take care of some procedural matters. First, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record. Without objection, is so ordered. Second, I ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by the members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record, that all members be permitted to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection, it is so ordered. Again, I'd like to welcome and thank all our witnesses. As an oversight committee, it's our standard practice to ask all witnesses to testify under oath. So if each of you will rise and raise your right hands, I'll administer the oath. Do you swear that, do you swear that the testimony you will give us today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that each of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. We'll now recognize the witnesses for their opening statements. Admiral Law, you're recognized for five minutes. Admiral, if you could pull that over so we can, you'll need to pull that over a little bit. More. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, and good morning. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Mrs. Schakowsky, for the uh, comments about the work being done by not only uh, the f people you see at this table, but by literally hundreds and thousands of uh, members of our organizations as they have uh, made every effort to do the nation's uh, business over the last uh, three months. Uh, I appreciate the chance to discuss the Coast Guard's uh, role in federal law enforcement and the service-wide implications of the new Homeland Security Challenge. The Coast Guard is, uh, among many other things, some of which the Chairman mentioned, the nation's law enforcement presence afloat. Uh, we're the enforcement arm at sea for commerce, for justice, for state, for DOD, for treasury, and for the drug czar. We array our ships and planes and people against uh, multiple asymmetric uh, national security threats, including drugs and illegal migrants and fish stock predators, uh, as well as terrorism, which has captured all of our attention uh, in the last several weeks. 
Drug interdiction, for example, uh, is a now and must remain national security priority. Drugs have a pervasive and corrosive impact on our society, contributed to violent crime, disease, and nearly 17,000 deaths in 1998. Just just uh, yesterday, an Atlanta Journal article uh, suggested that there were Middle East operatives attempting to uh, set up shop in South America to take advantage of the drug profits associated with the cocaine trade. That would, in fact, become uh, yet another example of a significant funding engine for international terrorism. And that is the nature of the challenge that we have in front of us. In addition, uh, illicit profits uh, are clearly financing. Uh, terrorist organizations, and this linkage we find uh, the need to interrupt. Uh, the Coast Guard is the designated lead agency for the maritime end of drug interdiction and shares the lead agency responsibility for air interdiction in, uh, with the Customs Service. And prior to 11 September and since 11 September, we continue to take this responsibility very seriously and remain committed to this mission with its now wider implications. The Coast Guard supports, first and foremost, the balance approach that is represented in the National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, we work very closely with all of our interagency partners. We meet often together in various formats uh, to make certain that the complementary efforts that we have are uh, additive with respect to the accomplishment of the goals stressed in the National Drug Control Strategy. Our operations rely. Uh, rely on our interagency partners as well as foreign military and law enforcement counterparts that we use all the time. Mostly they also rely on a very solid intelligence service underpinning, a foundation that each of us I think would cite as being absolutely an imperative to the ability for our respective organizations to get our jobs done. Much of that orderly plan as you know was interrupted on 9-11. Our our role in migrant interdiction is as important as ever. Uh, in fiscal 2001, uh, the Coast Guard interdicted about 4,000 people trying to illegally enter the United States. Uh, again, just in the last two days, uh, a very significant case off the uh, coast of Florida points out once more the importance of our ability to continue that mission. A, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, on my desk this morning was a cable from Ambassador Kern in Haiti rec uh, registering concerns on his part for even rumors that would continue to have the potential to uh, set off uh, mass migration challenges that are always at the uh, right at the borderline of, uh, of being a reality from Haiti and uh, as we know from, from Cuba. That 2001 was a relatively typical year, the 4,000 people that I just mentioned being interdicted. We attempt to make certain that the notion of illegality and unsafe passage at sea is the, the premise that we attempt to uh, 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 breed back into cells of, uh, uh, of uh, migration uh, generators. Uh, 1994, however, was not a typical year, and we all remember the uh, crush of that particular mass migration in the summer and fall when over 65,000 lives were saved at sea by the Coast Guard, uh, but all associated with mass migrations from both Haiti and from, uh, and from Cuba. Uh, these days, uh, the countries involved primarily are Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, uh, China, Ecuador, but on any given day there are 40 different nationalities represented somewhere in passage in the Caribbean theater trying to find their way to the United States. And that difference between uh, uh, the haves and the have-nots around our world will make that a, uh, a challenge for us uh, well into the foreseeable future. And if anything, I see that gap actually widening. Uh, the third thing I'd speak about just quickly is our fisheries enforcement mission. Uh, the Coast Guard is the only at-sea enforcement authority for fisheries regulations for our nation. Uh, our efforts in this area continue to be critical uh, to the effective management of a $25 billion U.S. industry, the commercial fishing industry, to ensure that our fish stocks uh, are not depleted. Furthermore, while inspecting a vessel's catch and gear to ensure compliance uh, with fisheries management regulations, we also have the opportunity, as the, as the chairman was suggesting earlier, to gain value in our other missions, uh, verify crew member status and identity, enforce safety regulations, and for this uh, particularly extremely dangerous occupation, rated literally the most dangerous occupation uh, in the United States. Following the terrorist attacks on September 11th, the Coast Guard immediately responded to every coast uh, in our nation, increasing Coast Guard presence to protect our ports and maritime transportation infrastructure, 
Clearly the port safety and security mission now stands at least equally with search and rescue as our number one priority. And over the last month, our primary focus has remained on maritime homeland security. However, the Coast Guard's increased role in port security responsibilities have not been without costs, as you have been suggesting, because we have been required to reevaluate the distribution of cutters and aircraft resources among all of our law enforcement missions to meet these surge operations resulting from, the, from September the 11th. Our multi-mission culture actually was one of the greatest advantages we had on the 11th of September. Uh, because our people are multi-mission in character, our assets, ships, boats, planes, uh, helicopters are also all multi-mission uh, in capability. So I was able to basically say, take a left and go to port security because that was the most prevalent need of the nation on the 11th of September and has been since. The challenge obviously uh, is as we try to define the new normalcy of what constitutes our required dedication to port security into the future, and what is that net gain associated with our capacity to do all those other things the chairman was challenging us to be responsive to in his opening statement. Uh, we will do all of that and more. Uh, a, a simple bar chart here offers at least a, 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 bit, a visible note as to uh, relative mission resource dedication on the 10th of September when we were sort of normally deployed around the world doing lots of different things and the attention that all of a sudden the bar all the way to the left, port security and safety, acquired in terms of our operational uh, investment of energy and resources uh, in the immediate aftermath of the, uh, of the tragic events of the 11th of September. Mr. Chairman, uh, at the other end of the day, uh, the future efforts uh, represent a challenge to us meeting all of our law enforcement goals, and we will take that on. We've made a great effort already to find a sustainable and effective balance among our missions. But at current resource levels, as you point out, combined with our significantly heightened homeland security presence that I do not see an end, so, an end to in the foreseeable future, uh, we will need uh, a boost in order to continue to do those things we mentioned before as being normal Coast Guard activities and pay attention to this heightened profile in homeland security. Over the last three months, uh, I have been basically uh, building for Governor Ridge a maritime security game plan. Uh, we have briefed that through Secretary Mineta and on to, and on to Governor Ridge uh, with, I think, uh, uh, with, I think, good acceptance at the other end of the day. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, in order for us to rebalance uh, from what we surged to on the, 12th of, on the 11th and 12th of September, when we, when we went from about a 1 or 2 percent dedication of assets to port security to somewhere over 50, our instincts as an organization are to send things to a SAR case and then back away until we find that sustaining level. Uh, that's that new normalcy I spoke about just a moment ago, uh, and we look forward to working with the committee to find uh, the, the proper balances, both as it relates to mission dedication and the resources to do those things for America. I look forward to your questions, sir. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Bonner? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to the committee. It's actually been a while since I've seen Congressman Gilman, and uh, um, it's good to see you again, uh, Ben. Um, let me say, let me just start off by saying that addressing the terrorist threat has been the highest priority of the U.S. Customs Service. It is the highest priority, and it has been since, since September the 11th. Uh, but I think I can assure this committee that uh, Although the resources of the U.S. Customs Service are severely strained, and they clearly are, uh, that we are certainly going to continue uh, our role in drug interdiction and uh, drug trafficking inve investigations, and that remains a priority of the U.S. Customs Service. Uh, in fact, in some ways, I believe that our heightened state of security that we've gone to at the U.S. Customs Service along the border with the INS is in some ways strengthening rather than weakening our counter-drug mission. Moreover, I think there's a, there is a nexus uh, between uh, uh, drug trafficking and, uh, and, uh, and to some degree and uh, the funding of terrorist organizations. Since September the 11th, the U.S. Customs Service has been focusing uh, on ensuring homeland defense. Uh, it's a role that we are uh, in many ways, U.S. Customs Service is well prepared to play. 
our presence at the 301 ports of entry into the United States across the country puts the U.S. Customs Service in a prominent position to protect America and to prevent uh, terrorists and the implements of terrorism and the weapons of terrorism from entering the United States. 8,000 U.S. Customs inspectors and canine enforcement officers are stationed across America and are responsible collectively for processing millions of passengers and vehicles and cargo shipments entering the United States each day. Their expertise in screening and inspecting both goods and people crossing our borders is a crucial asset in our counterterrorism response. In addition, approximately 2,700 special agents of the U.S. Customs Service are trained and experienced in conducting investigations, including financial investigations and investigations into the unlawful export of uh, weapons and technology uh, and equipment uh, that is uh, potentially useful to international terrorist organizations uh, against the, uh, against the, uh, our country. Um, these investigators are supported, uh, these special agents are supported by intelligence analysts who also, as you know, Mr. Chairman, work very closely with the U.S. intelligence community in developing and tracking information. The subcommittee is also very aware, this subcommittee is very aware and familiar with the uh, Customs Air and Marine Interdiction Division, which has assumed an important role in response to September the 11th. I believe you know the skill of the customs pilots and marine enforcement officers in patrolling America's seas and skies. And, and right now, by the way, part of those assets are uh, supporting the uh, NORAD uh, mission protecting uh, the United States. In many respects, uh, Mr. Chairman, our response to terrorism is a, an outgrowth of our traditional enforcement mission. Uh, from interdicting illegal narcotics to tracing money used to fund illegal activity to investigating the illegal export of weapons and technology to the inspecting of goods and cargo for contraband. All of that, all of those things contribute to and I think complement and strengthen our efforts at the U.S. Customs Service to combat the terrorist threat. I've established at Customs Headquarters a, a, a new office for anti-terrorism within the agency and I've appointed an experienced security expert and senior military leader to head that office who reports directly to me. And that's to better focus our efforts and our training and our detection capabilities against uh, terrorist weapons, including weapons of mass destruction. I should also mention uh, the cooperation within the administration and the important role that Governor Ridge and the Office of Homeland Security play. This cooperation, I believe, is essential both to ensure that we are effectively responding to the terrorist threat and, in addition, effective coordination uh, by all the federal partners that are involved in the counterterrorism effort, and you have uh, many of them right here at this table in front of you, uh, can help relieve the strain within each of our respective agencies uh, that we individually face. Uh, immediately after the terrorist attacks on September the 11th, Customs implemented a level one of security alert. That's the highest level of alert of the U.S. Customs Service, and we did this in conjunction with the INS, but that's the highest level of alert short of actually shutting down our borders. And that alert calls for sustained and intensive examinations, including heightened and increased inspection of both people and goods crossing our border. We still remain at level one alert today. Along with the INS, the Customs has bolstered security at all our borders, especially along our northern border with Canada. We now staff every border crossing, uh, even those in remote locations, with a minimum of two armed inspectors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Maintaining that minimum while ensuring a smooth and timely flow of trade across our border has required a significant expenditure of resources by the U.S. Customs Service. Our frontline personnel our inspectors and canine enforcement officers are working 12 to 16 hour days, seven, six and seven days a week, uh, and a, a vast amount uh, of overtime, far more than normal, is being expended by the uh, inspectors of the Customs Service. We've temporarily detailed uh, over 100 inspectors to the uh, northern border and we're adding another 50 uh, within the next few days. Turning to their investigative activity since September the 11th, we have, of course, assigned agents to assist the FBI uh, and others on the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. That, uh, that has occurred after September the 11th uh, and has um, been reduced somewhat over the last two months. 
We've also contributed, as I believe you know, Mr. Chairman, 110 agents to the Federal Sky Marshal Program. And I note that while the strain on our personnel has, has and continues to be great under Level 1 alert, that we look forward to offsetting some of that pressure uh, through the funding of new inspectors and special agent positions in our FY2002 budget. And I will tell you that we will bring those new hires on as quickly as, and as efficiently as possible. Uh, we've also requested, we've been requested, and we continue to provide assistance, as I mentioned, to NORAD with respect to uh, our P3 AEW aircraft. We've implemented, by the way, several uh, initiatives that this committee should be aware of. Let me just briefly mention them. The first is Operation GreenQuest, and that's a major effort to starve terrorist, international terrorist groups of their financial wherewithal. GreenQuest, by the way, draws upon the uh, formidable extra expertise and uh, long-standing money laundering expertise within the U.S. Customs Service. That's an operation, GreenQuest is an operation led by Customs and it has the participation of other Treasury law enforcement agencies as well as the Department of Justice and the FBI. We're also using Customs expertise in what are called strategic investigations through Operation Shield America. This operation is aimed at the unlawful export of unlicensed weapons, equipment and technology that could be used by international terrorist organizations. And we've also created a customs trade partnership against terrorism, working with the trade. We've undertaken an initiative with the trade community to tighten security of commercial cargo to better secure that, the supply chain, to deny access uh, to uh, the supply chain by terrorist organizations. So we've also moved to enhance the quality and, and quantity of advanced information that customs and other uh, federal agencies get and uh, in that regard uh, uh, mr mike of this committee and others in the congress were helpful in uh, making mandatory advanced passenger information that's going to be very very useful to both customs and to the ins in addition we're working on the, at an interagency level uh, uh, with my counterparts that are seated here at the table with me uh, to find ways to better secure uh, the borders into the United States against the terrorist threat. And uh, that, that is developing a broad, integrated, coordinated response. In fact, last, last Friday, I think, afternoon, uh, I met with both Commissioner Ziegler and uh, uh, Admiral Loy uh, to further develop a coordinated border strategy. We've also been actively engaged in discussions with both the governments of Canada and Mexico to increase information sharing and develop common security measures for processing of people and goods uh, from uh, those countries into the United States. So we've been focusing a lot on certainly the terrorist threat, understandably in light of the attacks on America on September the 11th and the continuing threat that uh, the Al-Qaeda and, and associated terrorist organizations pose to our country. But I will say, I think, that a lot of what we've done actually has made it uh, more difficult uh, for drug trafficking as we've intensified our overall presence, particularly at the, at the border. And I think the evidence is there. Actually, after we imp implemented uh, Level 1 Alert, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, looking at the data for about the first three weeks or so, and I'm talking about the southwest border, um, uh, Essentially, we believe the traffickers were withholding shipments uh, because of the increased uh, security and examinations and inspections that were taking place on the southwest border. Uh, the traffickers on the Mexican side were holding back their shipments, in my, in my judgment, for about several weeks uh, until it became necessary to move their shipments. And so in October, we actually have seen a substantial increase in, uh, in uh, drug seizures along our borders. In fact, uh, if you compare October of this year uh, with October of uh, 2000, there's been an approximately 30 percent increase in drug seizures that's taken place. Just one other thing I'll mention along the area, uh, and then I'm going to wrap this up, but in the area of the, uh, uh, our drug investigation capability, and that is that there, there has not been a substantial reduction in the time that our special agents are spending investigating drug trafficking cases. These are controlled deliveries and other drug investigations that we work cooperatively with the DEA. Uh, before September the 11th, uh, Customs had approximately 1,500 of its Customs Special Agents cross-designated by the DEA to conduct narcotics investigation under Title 21 authority. 
and I have no intention of reducing that number. Uh, we will continue to work effectively with the DEA to investigate drug traffickers, and we will continue our strong drug interdiction efforts. Um, beyond that, I might just mention specifically that in conjunction with using uh, our air and marine assets, uh, Customs has affected, for example, just very recently working with Admiral Loy's people, the U.S. Coast Guard, two seizures from go-fast boats that were operating in the Caribbean off the coast of Puerto Rico. And at the conclusion of my testimony, if we have just a moment, I've got about a two-minute tape I'd like to play for this committee that shows that one of those seizures, the, the, the two seizures, uh, by the way, total were 2,500 kilograms of cocaine coming uh, off the coast of Puerto Rico, the arrest of seven individuals. Over the past five weeks, we've uh, uh, seized approximately 3,900 kilograms of cocaine. So what we're seeing, I think, is as we're blocking the Mexican border more effectively than we ever had, and it's because of the terrorist security threat at that border, what we're seeing is the major drug trafficking organizations, the Colombians, uh, are going to alternative routes, and, uh, and we need to anticipate and prepare and respond to that, because I think what we're seeing is increased pressure both in the Caribbean and in the Eastern Pacific. But that, that concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman. Uh, subject to, if we could take a couple of moments, I'd just uh, I'd like to play the, uh, the short video of the recent uh, interception and seizure of a uh, major amount of cocaine off the coast of Puerto Rico with the, with the Chairman's permission. Happily. This is on November 21st, and it's one of the two seizures, so it's very recently, this is when the last, uh, within the last two weeks. This Black Hawk helicopter uh, operated by Customs that is now tracking a, uh, uh, a go-fast boat uh, that is loaded with cocaine, and very, yeah, you'll see now the, 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 the bad guys, the traffickers, are literally dumping out the bales now that they've been, uh, uh, that the Black Hawk is latched onto them. Uh, and they dumped out bales. That was over a thousand kilos of cocaine that came out of that boat. Now you can see on the left, this is a marine enforcement officers of the Customs Service that are closing in on the, uh, the go-fast boat. The bad guys are on the boat on the right. It is uh, trying to get them to stop. It's pulling up alongside them. Um, they don't seem to want to stop. We actually go across the bow of the now you can see here that the, uh, the traffickers, the smugglers in the boat on the, uh, on the bottom of the screen, we were drawing down on them. I think they've decided now to stop. And we actually uh, arrested the, uh, the six individuals that were in that boat. Of course, we seized the boat. It's being forfeited. And we seized a, thousand, uh, a little over 1,000 kilograms of, uh, of cocaine. This is another, just closing in on another of the go-fast boats with two uh, uh, of the Customs uh, Marine uh, boats that have the awnings on them. A little more effective when you have two boats, actually, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> a little faster to... So the, uh, the traffickers on that boat are being apprehended. I think this, by the way, just graphically demonstrates one thing for this committee, I hope, and that is that the, the interdiction efforts uh, uh, and the drug enforcement efforts of the uh, Customs Service and, and the Coast Guard and uh, other agencies here have not, have not abated. And if anything, uh, to some degree, the heightened level of security at the Customs Service has actually resulted in uh, uh, an increase and actually a substantial increase in the interdiction of, uh, of drugs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ziegler. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I, I wish that uh, the Commissioner Bonner had not shown that because if my Border Patrol agents who are down on the dusty, hot southwest border see these guys out in boats, they're going to want to come join you. So, <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about the impact on the INS uh, of the increased Homeland Security initiatives that we've had since uh, September 11th. Uh, needless to say that uh, September 11th has had a profound effect on uh, everything and everybody both in this country and certainly in the government. No question about it. 
The INS uh, feels a particular burden in light of those events uh, because of the, um, the missions that we have uh, at the INS, and it, they're, they're multifaceted, as you know. We um, are the only agency that has the legal authority to grant admission uh, or determine admissibility of people coming into the United States. And of course, given the, uh, uh, how the terrorists came in, that is a, that's a, a huge burden. Uh, we have uh, the responsibility for patrolling uh, and, and controlling the border between the ports of entry. Uh, and we share joint responsibility at the ports of entry with uh, Commissioner Bonner and his organization. Uh, we have responsibility for enforcing the immigration laws in the interior of the United States. And as we know, we have uh, some considerable issues uh, in that respect. And then uh, uh, when you add all uh, of that together and you also add on top of it the responsibility uh, for uh, adjustments in status, uh, for conferring benefits, uh, and for otherwise uh, facilitating legal immigration into this country, we have a we, we feel a great burden as a result of September 11th, and we felt a great burden, of course, even before that. Uh, no doubt that our, our attention uh, since September 11th has been focused on those events and the outcomes of those events. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Bonner pointed out, we went to threat level one almost immediately after the planes hit uh, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And we've been at, at threat level one since that time uh, where, as the commissioner uh, explained what that does in terms of the level of inspection we do, and I won't go into that, but it, it clearly increases our, um, the impact on our resources uh, to be at a threat level one. The, uh, at the INS, we have taken 1,000 of our 2,000 investigators and have devoted them to this investigation, and they continue to be devoted to it. In fact, as of yesterday, about uh, 4,000 uh, interviews and investigations had been, uh, our investigators had participated in. So we've had a, a huge uh, play, if you will, in the investigation itself. The Border Patrol has been impacted by this um, on immediately after September 11th. We deployed 318 Border Patrol agents to eight different airports around the country and got them there actually within 40 hours of the uh, attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon uh, in order to help beef up security at the um, airports. We've deployed uh, some additional inspectors to the northern border. Uh, we have deployed four, uh, 150 roughly Border Patrol agents uh, to the ports of entry, uh, which Border Patrol agents normally are not in the ports of entry, as you know, but we've sent them there to uh, help facilitate the inspection process because, as Commissioner Bonner knows, uh, when we start um, doing it at the level we're doing it, uh, it creates wait times, and we've uh, sent Border Patrol agents to try to, to help with that process. Uh, we will be deploying, in addition to the 100 or so that we've already deployed up to the northern border, we will be sending another 100 up there in the very uh, near future. And to top, of, top all of that off, we've got the uh, Olympics coming up which we uh, have a minimum of 200 Border Patrol agents that we're going to be sending out there uh, for security purposes. So it, the impact on the Border Patrol itself has been uh, rather significant. We've been attempting uh, to carry out our normal duties, and we think we've been doing that uh, reasonably successfully given uh, the impacts. As, as uh, Commissioner Bonner pointed out, it's, it's not easy to try to do all these things and, and keep your normal flow of business going, but we've been working at it as well as trying to fulfill some presidential mandates uh, that were given to us uh, as, a, as a result of, or given to me as a result of um, my being confirmed by the Senate. One of them was to structure a reorganization of the INS, and secondly was to reduce the backlogs uh, in our service side of our business, and we've been working at that. The, uh, the strain on the agency is huge. Uh, we have been, uh, like the commissioner, uh, we have been using overtime uh, reduced uh, leave time, uh, canceled leave time, all sorts of things to, to multiply our forces in the field. In fact, we've, as of yesterday, I believe we've used about 125,000 additional overtime hours uh, throughout our system as a result of the September 11th attack. 
We also have been deploying, as I mentioned, agents and others to different parts of the country to meet certain needs, and those deployments in and of themselves, of course, create strains on the employees when they're, they go away from home and for 30 or 60 days, they stay in a place away from their families, uh, and that creates uh, obviously a problem in terms of just our impact on our personnel. Uh, recruiting and retention um, is always a problem, and it has become uh, even more of a problem for us uh, because of some issues that I talked about the last time I testified before your subcommittee. Um, and it, the Sky Marshall program has been a particular impact on us. In fact, in the uh, just, just entering first Sky Marshall class, uh, roughly 75 percent of the new entrants were former Border Patrol agents that had been recruited. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little tough on us both to recruit and to retain uh, folks. Uh, and then, of course, uh, given the events of September 11th, we have this constant flow of new initiatives that are being thrown at our, in our direction and the need to respond to every new idea for a new initiative uh, we have to respond to. So that takes up an awful lot of time. Our, our approach has been fairly um, consistent. Uh, we recognize that we can't do everything uh, like we uh, tried to do before, but we can do things in priority orders. Uh, our focus has also been on our strengthening our core mission. Take those things that we need to do, strengthen them, and get our mission uh, up to the place that it needs to be. And while at the same time trying to stay out of uh, the uh, what I call bureaucratic guerrilla warfare that goes on any time you're in, in any kind of um, uh, government uh, job, we're making progress. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I introduced or announced uh, a restructuring proposal for the INS that would uh, would take and create two bureaus, a service bureau and an enforcement bureau uh, within the INS to more focus our mission and to have a clear lines of, and chains of command and hopefully uh, strengthen our enforcement side of the business as well as the service side of the business. We think that's going to have a long-term positive impact. The implementation of that restructuring has got to be done very carefully with the backdrop of our new responsibilities as a, res uh, <clears throat> as a result of September 11th. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we think that we can go forward without that, without disrupting uh, the efficiency of the organization. We're continuing our major smuggling cases. Uh, those are very important uh, to our interior enforcement operations, and I'm hoping within the next week or two to announce some uh, major developments in that area. We also uh, have been working with our counterparts in the Immigration uh, Canada and signed a, an agreement with them last week on some immigration initiatives that we think will help us um, do a better job, not just at the border, but do a better job of extending our borders out so that we can stop people before they ever get to North America um, in coming into this country and trying to do uh, harm. We also are uh, in working to enhance our interior enforcement operations. And Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned to you right before this hearing, I would like to use this hearing to make an announcement about uh, an initiative that we're uh, starting literally today. As uh, you most of people have seen in the newspaper, there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that there are a large number of people in this country who, uh, we call them abscondees, they are people who have uh, been in illegal status, they have uh, been put into deportation proceedings, they've gone through the judicial process. Uh, at the end of the judicial process, they, there was a deportation order uh, for them to um, be removed from the country, and then, um, as you described it, they jumped bail. Uh, they absconded and uh, disappeared into the woodwork of the country. The number that has been thrown around in the press is 250,000 of those people. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the number is actually about 314,000 based upon our analysis yesterday. One of the things that I've, I've discovered in doing my due diligence is that um, with the exception of some very um, um, serious, serious criminal aliens, uh, by and large, those people who have absconded and against whom warrants have been issued uh, for their arrest, administrative arrest for deportation, uh, those names of those people have never been entered into the NCIC index of wants and warrants. Uh, so if someone is picked up somewhere, 
uh, and a check is done of the records, there's no record out there that there is a warrant for this person's arrest. So we have people that may be picked up and, and we never know that uh, they have, uh, a final order of deportation is there. Uh, I have uh, started an initiative to have entered into the NCIC uh, Wants and Warrants uh, Index the names of all those individuals. It's a big project, it's going to take a while, and it's going to take some resources, but I think it's, uh, I think it's important that, uh, that we do this. Uh, and I want to make it really clear that no, we're not talking here about some kind of, of sweep on illegal aliens. These are people who have been, gone through the judicial process, uh, gone through immigration judges, through appeals, and have final orders of deportation that have been entered against them and they have uh, jumped bail or absconded. Uh, and we think that this will send a message that, um, that when you come to the United States that uh, you're expected to stay here on, on the terms that you're admitted on and that uh, coming here and staying in illegal status is not appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry I've taken more time than I was supposed to, but uh, I just want to let you know that our ability uh, to do our job is really limited only by our resources and the time it takes to put uh, resources online. I also would want to make the uh, statement that I, I am very pleased uh, and I'm very thankful uh, to the Congress and to the administration for recognizing the resource needs that the INS needs and uh, have been, uh, been very forthcoming in working with us on the budget, on the appropriations um, in order for us to be able to move this big old ship uh, down the channel a little bit. And uh, I, again, I just want to say how much we appreciate the cooperation of the Congress and the administration. Thank you, Mr. Ziegler. Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues today before you and Ranking Member Cummings and uh, Mrs. Davis. It is good to appear before your committee again. And I particularly appreciate this committee's leadership uh, on the fight against drugs in our country and drawing attention to uh, the impact that the events of September 11 may have on this effort. Since the inception of the recent national uh, crisis on September 11, the DEA has responded in a number of ways by mobilizing resources against the threat of terrorism. First of all, the uh, DEA has participated in the Federal Sky Marshal Program and has contributed a total of 126 special agents representing 3% of the agency's investigative personnel uh, to the program. These are all volunteers who are deployed on 60-day temporary duty assignments and are drawn from a cross-section of the country uh, to minimize any adverse impact on our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, secondly, the El Paso Intelligence Center uh, has supported the FBI investigation of the September 11 attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Uh, EPIC has been providing intelligence and analytical support to the FBI's Operation uh, Pent Bomb, the De Department of Defense Operation, and the uh, Coast Guard's Operation Coast Watch. To date, in support of these operations uh, and other member agencies, uh, EPIC personnel have extended over 9,000 man hours, processed over 64,000 queries, and generated over 1,200 cables. And as, and as a result of this effort, EPIC has been able to provide in excess of 10,000 leads or pieces of supplemental information to investigators. In addition, the DEA has been engaged uh, in the intelligence uh, arena. Uh, we have routinely uh, queried our human drug intelligence sources, especially those overseas, for any potential leads or intelligence that may impact upon national security or terrorism investigations and have certainly provided any information immediately to the FBI who has the lead in this responsibility. In addition, the DEA has participated in the anti-terrorism task forces. In each federal ju judicial district, the DEA has designated one agent as a point of contact to the Attorney General's anti-terrorism task force. And so, uh, while the prevention of additional acts of terror uh, must continue to receive the highest level of attention from all of the agencies, there remains a focus and a commitment uh, on the DEA's central mission of drugs. If we look specifically at the impact of September 11, I think there's some uh, good news uh, in the uh, terrible tragedy that occurred in the sense that there has become a greater public awareness uh, of the nexus between 
uh, drugs and terrorism and the money that flows to violent groups. I appreciate the chairman yesterday uh, being at the DEA, participating in a symposium uh, on narco, uh, narco terrorism uh, and the impact that it has on our society today and the serious connection that is there. Hopefully that will aware the, uh, increase the public awareness of this uh, connection. And also, as a result of September 11, I think there's an opportunity for our society to enter an era of greater responsibility. All of a sudden, uh, drugs not only are illegal and harmful, but also there's an understanding that there is a benefit that goes to extraordinarily violent groups that do harm to our society. And just as in World War II, I hope that we're able to uh, capitalize on this and uh, make serious strides in reducing drug use in our country. Uh, the second thing that we've uh, seen since September 11, uh, as Commissioner Bonner rightfully pointed out, law enforcement presence makes a difference. Immediately after uh, the September 11 attack, the uh, traffickers uh, appeared to st stop moving the drugs through their trafficking routes because of the intense pressure along the border. Uh, and so they held off, and then at some point they had to continue, and as they uh, continued their trafficking, because of the intense pressure along the border, the seizures increased dramatically. But we also see this uh, uh, from the DEA's perspective uh, inland, uh, whereas uh, there was more drugs transported in the uh, air transportation routes, that has moved to ground transportation routes because of the intense uh, scrutiny uh, of passengers as they go through the airports. And so there's been a change of patterns. In addition, you see where as uh, uh, the intense pressure in New York City uh, has uh, scared away traffickers uh, to a certain extent of doing their exchanges and their first deliveries in the United States in New York City. I was in Connecticut and we saw the impact there that some of the trafficking routes have bypassed New York City and moved into New Jersey and into Connecticut and some of the outlying areas. And so the law enforcement presence has made a difference and it's been our responsibility to adjust to the new patterns. And so law enforcement has to be uh, flexible and to adjust and the DEA has taken those steps. The third impact of September 11 is what is the focus of this hearing, which is the impact on resources and long-term planning on organizational structure. And clearly a comprehensive review is appropriate and is underway to eliminate any duplication of efforts so that maximum resources can be devoted to public security. To the uh, best ex to the extent possible, the DEA has attempted to integrate the homeland security responsibilities and our duties in counterterrorism into our existing law enforcement functions so that the enhanced public safety is a dividend of more diligent and well-informed counter-drug efforts. Accordingly, the DEA uh, in the airports and railway interdiction units are on high alert and cognizant of the likelihood of encountering members of terrorist cells as they transit the country. Uh, clearly, law enforcement presence makes a difference in that arena as well and has resulted in leads and hopefully will in the future. Regardless of the manner in which drug traffickers choose to regroup in response to our new counterterrorism initiatives, our single mission drug agents must and will continue to provide adequate uh, anti-drug coverage. In the long term, I believe that our responsibilities overseas will have a greater uh, emphasis and has increased because of the instability in Afghanistan. Uh, we are laying plans to have uh, additional resources in Uzbekistan and in Pakistan uh, to help in the interdiction efforts of drugs coming out of Afghanistan. It is an unusual opportunity we have a country that produces 70 percent of the world's supply of heroin to be able to go in and to impact uh, that dramatic source of supply. And the impact of the United States would be if we can reduce that supply in Afghanistan is that it will impact our purity of heroin in the United States uh, and the price of heroin in the United States, hopefully uh, in a positive fashion. Because the DEA is an agency that relies extensively upon interagency cooperation, the new responsibilities in counterterrorism are nothing new to us, and we will continue to maximize our cooperation with our state and local counterparts and with our federal partners that are at this table. 
we operate to a large extent with our federal partners under memorandums of, under, of understanding. And if there's any adjustments that are needed in those to maximize our organizational structures and efficiencies, then we are happy to cooperate. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the DEA fully supports the Attorney General Ashcroft's uh, initiative and Governor Ridge's efforts to restructure our federal law enforcement assets in a manner that best serves public security. As we move decisively to coordinate our counterterrorism efforts, we must take appropriate actions to make certain that the momentum of our counter-drug initiatives is not adversely affected, and I appreciate the leadership of this committee in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the uh, privilege of allowing me to testify here today. As you know, on uh, September the 11th, the way we do business changed. Uh, it changed for the FBI, it changed for all of law enforcement, and it changed for all of America. Now we must make some of the changes we experienced permanent and develop other changes or other ways of doing business and serving the American public if we are to be an effective and an efficient national law enforcement agency. The FBI has jurisdictional responsibility for over 300 classifications of federal crimes. Some of them are exclusively the jurisdiction of the FBI, and some of them are violations where we share jurisdiction with other agencies, either federal, state, or local agencies. Some of these violations, which we investigate with shared jurisdiction, are ones where the other agency doesn't have the capacity to shoulder the investigations al alone. An example of this would be crimes occurring in Indian country, where the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, shares jurisdiction, but they don't have the capacity to handle the volume of cases or the required expertise for some of the cases. Drug violations are also ones which we share with many other agencies. However, the way drugs have permeated our society and lead to so many other violations, and the way they are a part and parcel of so many criminal enterprises, our jurisdiction is necessary to try to fully investigate and dismantle these criminal organizations. In 1998, the FBI established a five-year strategic plan to set investigative priorities in line with a tiered structure. Tier 1 comprises those crimes or intelligence problems which threaten our national or our economic security. Tier 2 involves offenses which involve criminal enterprises or those which adversely affect our public integrity. And Tier 3 includes violations which affect individuals or property. In line with this plan, we have increasingly enhanced our resources dedicated to the areas of counterintelligence and counterterrorism. Now, let me discuss briefly how the recent terrorism incidents have affected the resources assigned to the FBI. Our budget authorizes the FBI to have 8,883 special agents to conduct investigations in the field. Now, this does not include those assigned as managers or supervisors in field offices, those assigned to FBI headquarters, or those assigned to international or special assignments. Prior to 9-11, 73% of them, or approximately 6,500 agents, were assigned to investigate criminal investigative program matters, that is, organized crime, white-collar crime, drugs, violent crimes, or civil rights violations. A little over 2% of these resources were assigned to applicant and or training matters, and the remaining 25% were assigned to counterintelligence or counterterrorism matters. Following the terrorism incidents, about 67%, or more than 4,000 of those agents in the field who previously worked criminal investigative matters were diverted to conduct investigation related to the pent bomb investigation or the subsequent anthrax letters or hoax letters. Also, agents were diverted to working hate crimes directed at individuals of Middle Eastern descent. During the first two weeks after 9-11, all agents, both those working the terrorist-related matters as well as those who continued working the traditional criminal violations, worked on an average well over 13 hours a day. We are continuing to utilize almost 3,000 agents more than we are budgeted for to investigate counterterrorism. Presently, our utilization of agent resources is showing a gradual return to more normal levels. We're now using about 55% of what pre previously had been our criminal investigative resources on those violations. 
However, with the increased emphasis on the prevention of any terrorist act, it is doubtful that we will ever return to the same staffing levels for each program which existed prior to 9-11. Prior to September the 11th, the FBI was usually involved in about 250 assessments and responses related to suspected violations, or excuse me, suspected weapons of mass destruction events each year. During the first three weeks of October alone, we have had more than 3,300 of these occurrences, which included 2,500 suspected anthrax incidents. Additionally, 278 hate crime allegations uh, associated with the events of 9-11 have been investigated. To date, 35 of our 56 field offices have established joint terrorism task forces, most of which existed prior to September the 11th, and the director has instructed that all of our field offices establish a JTTF as soon as possible. The FBI has also established a financial review group, which is a multi-agency task force investigating all funding avenues utilized by the terrorist net networks. In order to effectively address terrorism threats and the traditional crime problems which the FBI faces on a long-term basis, the director has developed an internal reorganization plan. The first part of this reorganization plan has received congressional approval and the FBI is moving forward. The initial stages of this reorganization is at the headquarters level. But in the overall reorganization, there are many factors to consider, including the long-term shifting of resources from traditional criminal investigative priorities to counterterrorism. However, decisions concerning resource allocations to the various criminal programs has not been finalized. There is an ongoing, comprehensive examination of all of the criminal violations which the FBI addresses to assist in this, reorganiza in this reorganization. Our continued involvement in multi-agency task forces addressing multiple crime problems will be of the utmost importance. All of our field offices have established various task forces in addition to the joint terrorism task forces, which are designed to address a myriad of traditional crime problems. These task forces not only enhance the FBI's resources by establishing law enforcement links with local, state, and other federal agencies, but they enhance the sharing of intelligence which crosses those program lines. We intend to focus our efforts on significant criminal enterprises and the most serious personal and economic crimes to address community safety and violations within our prosecutive guidelines. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for allowing me to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions which you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Before we move to questions, I'm going to have um, Mr. Gilman, our distinguished vice chairman, is going to has a brief opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, Chairman Souter, thank you for arranging this very timely hearing amongst our law enforcement agencies, and uh, their testimony was excellent. Today, we'll uh, review what the heads of these uh, law enforcement agencies have to say about concerning the impact that the recent emphasis on homeland security has had on each of their uh, departments. And I will welcome from them what more we can uh, be doing as we get into questions uh, with regard to their ability to carry out uh, their important responsibilities under the present crisis. In addition, we'll also be considering the status of any long-term planning that is currently being done to assure that appropriate agency resources and proper attention is and will be continuing uh, to be dedicated to their missions up the road. While we're all unified in our resolve to make certain that our nation's homeland security is adequately addressed uh, to stem off any future terrorist attacks, it's important that we recognize the potential for law enforcement resources to be stretched beyond their means. In fact, uh, we're hearing reports that resources for other law enforcement missions, such as our drug interdiction, may be diverted 
uh, to fill the new demand for homeland security. Accordingly, any discussion on homeland security and the impact upon our nation's law enforcement agencies must include a discussion of whether or not the need exists to consolidate certain law enforcement functions within the various federal agencies, and we hear talk once again about some consolidation. It's also important to note that our increased effort of Homeland Security has, in some instances, helped in our battle against illicit drugs. For example, on our southwest border, where Mexican-American authorities report the drugs are piling up on the Mexican side due to our nation's increased vigilance and securing of our borders after the September 11th attacks. This example points to what can be accomplished should our nation place its resolve behind the illicit drug battle, and we commend our DEA for the work they're doing as well as our other agencies uh, who have expressed uh, their <clears throat> review of what they are accomplishing. And certainly the demonstration we saw today of the fast boat initiative by Customs is, is, is another example of what can be done with good cooperation <clears throat> between our agencies. It's vital that we not ignore the importance of providing adequate resources in our current battle against drugs from whatever source. It's important, too, that we refrain from the temptation to reallocate our anti-drug resources while gaining victory after victory against <clears throat> the terrorists, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces. And of course, they are major producers and sellers of drug substances to finance their terrorist activities. Instead, we should use this opportunity to further our resolve and to purge our nation from the drug trafficking that comes from the Afghanistan region and to be able to strike while the iron is hot. Mr. Chairman, these are extremely important issues and we look forward to being able to get into a discussion with our panelists when we return to questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm going to yield to Mr. Cummings for the first five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for, uh, for calling this hearing. Um, Mr. Ziegler, I want to just uh, just ask you a few things. Um, the you were saying that seventy five percent of the sky marshal, I guess, is applicants are are from the uh, border patrol. Is that what you said? No, no Congressman. The uh, the first class of of um, sky marshals that were going through training. In that first class, about approximately 75 percent of them um, are uh, Border Patrol agents, former Border Patrol agents. Uh -huh. And so I guess that's had a, a tremendous impact on your operation. It, it would seem logical. Well, it, it certainly will if, it, uh, if we continue to bleed that way. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we don't know how many Border Patrol agents have actually applied for these Sky Marshal positions. Uh, I think the um, my recollection is that the total number that have been selected at, as of the moment is around 70 or 80, about 70 or 80 that actually have been selected for it, but we have no idea how many of them are in the process and just haven't mm -hmm. gotten the word. Your announcement this morning about the NCIC, um, the, I'm just curious as to I mean, when you had your budget, you complimented the Congress of, uh, and the President on being supportive of you uh, with regard to your budget. And um, I'm just wondering, is that, is that, was that part of the discussion? So, uh, you sounded as if there is going to, it's going to call for a lot of resources to, to do that and a lot of effort. Um, is that a part of it? In other words, the, the, your budget situation? I mean, well, you... it's not a, a line item in the budget, but it's part of the interior enforcement operation. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have to prioritize how we want to go about uh, doing our interior enforcement. So it would be out of that part of the budget. Mm -hmm. And so have you made any, any predictions as to how many of these 314,000 um, folk who and I, I agree with you, by the way. I mean, if people have gone through 
ju the judicial process and they have been ordered to leave the country and they are um, avoiding that. I think we should take all appropriate action to address that issue. But I was just wondering, you know, what kind of dent do you expect or have your people projected with regard to getting these folks into the NCIC? Uh, because you must see some benefit or you wouldn't be doing it. Okay. Uh, Congressman, of course, it's a little bit difficult to, to estimate something that you haven't uh, used, a uh, program you haven't used before. but making the assumption that all 314,000 are still in the country, which may not be a good assumption. Some of them may have just left on their own and, <clears throat> and we didn't know that. Um, we guess that it'll be somewhere between 7 and 10 percent a year that we will be able to identify on the high side. Mm -hmm. um, now, as you know, as we get, the, and this is a ramp up situation. Tomorrow morning they won't all be in NCIC. It will take a while to, because a lot of this is going to have to be hand entered uh, because of the nature of the uh, reports that we have. So it will ramp up over time, but uh, we think that when it's fully in there that at least at the outset we'll probably see a 7 to 10 percent identification of those people that are in there. Do we know whether, whether any of those people who were directly involved in the September 11th uh, tragedy uh, would have fit into to this category? In other words, that people who were ordered to be deported, I'm just no. curious. None, no, of them? Not, none that I'm aware of. Not, not of the 19, no, sir. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson, with regard to um, Afghanistan and drugs, um, we've heard testimony at this hearing and before this body, and I think you were here at one of the hearings where um, they were telling us that as far as the war effort is concerned, um, a lot of, they did not believe that at that time, this was a few weeks ago, a lot of drug money was used to support the Taliban and Qaeda and bin Laden. Um, and I was just wondering, you, you know, you were talking about the effects of, of uh, measures that have been taken by the United States government since September 11th. And I was wondering, have you seen, I mean, with all this bombing in Afghanistan, have you, have you seen uh, any uh, impact with regard to, to crop production and uh, drugs coming out of Afghanistan? I mean, have you, or, or are you able to determine that? Uh, yes, Congressman. Uh, there has been uh, certainly an impact. The focus of the efforts of the United States, of course, is to get the terrorists and those right. responsible. Uh, but it has clearly uh, uh, disrupted and impacted uh, the production, uh, the use of the uh, conversion laboratories. Uh, it is more difficult. Uh, initially, uh, they were releasing the uh, stockpiles uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, they had stockpiled up to 60 percent of the uh, opium production each year, and that was being released, and so it was continuing to flood the borders. Uh, it appears that uh, the Afghan farmers are uh, in varying degrees replanting, and uh, I hope that uh, as uh, we have a post-Taliban uh, circumstance in Afghanistan that we'll be able to go and impact uh, what is happening there now and the future of that country. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, we have a, a vested interest in the United States uh, there because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, in Baltimore, it very well will, will affect uh, the, the heroin supply here, the cost, the purity of it, as to what actions we're able to take in Afghanistan and reduce the supply. Clearly, the, uh, you mentioned the Taliban. Uh, they are funded by uh, drug trafficking proceeds to varying degrees. The evidence is very clear. There appears to be a growing body of evidence that we're still looking at as to the other connections with drug trafficking and the other terrorist organizations. Just one last question, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for your courtesy. Um, Mr. Hutchinson, as, the, as, the, um, as these forces that have come together to form a new government are coming together, it seems like they're slowly, they're moving towards uh, some kind of uh, government. I mean, do you expect our government to have uh, any impact or have any say with regard to that new government 
and the piece of the government that addresses drugs. I mean, there may be some things that we can bring to the table about our efforts to address drugs. Since they're forming a new government, it seems logical that um, we might want to have some say in that because we don't want to go right back to uh, a situation where drugs are, are used to uh, supply money to attack our, our own country. And I'm just curious. Absolutely. We have a great interest in working with our international partners to have an influence on any uh, post-Taliban government in Afghanistan. And hopefully they will be amenable to international concerns, uh, not just uh, European and here in America, but in addition, uh, the uh, nation, neighboring nations of Pakistan, uh, Russia, Uzbekistan, uh, greatly impacted by the heroin coming out of Afghanistan. So I think there will be a, a broad coalition of international influence uh, as they develop policy post-Taliban. Thank you all very much. Thank you. As, as you've heard, we have a, a series of votes, but what I'm going to do, because the first one always drifts uh, long, is I'm going to, because we have so many questions, I'm going to skip the first one, try to make the two five minutes, uh, so we can make sure we get some of the questions in the record. And I wanted to, to clarify, uh, too, that the jurisdictional range of this uh, subcommittee is extremely broad. Not only do we have uh, primary jurisdiction on narcotics authorizing on the drug czar, as well as is uh, oversight of any area of the federal government that touches on narcotics. But as with the uh, war on, on drugs uh, broadened, all the human service agencies were put under this committee, HHS um, in addition to uh, education and HUD. And then at the last Congress to give flexibility, because we saw when we work with the borders, commerce was also moved under this committee. So uh, the, the range uh, of how we approach this is pretty broad. And one of the things we've uh, zeroed in on in the, in the subcommittee this year, particularly after 9-11, but we had actually agreed to do this with both the U.S. Canada and U.S. Mexico uh, parliamentarian groups, was to look at the border in particular, which is very related to uh, commerce in the United States, as well as narcotics, as well as immigration. What we've learned is you can't deal with one without the others. And, and we were going to proceed with the number of hearings before 9-11, which clearly now are, are, are heightened. So uh, uh, one, uh, some of my first questions I want to uh, direct uh, regarding uh, the border issues, knowing that um, uh, uh, we've had a, the biggest change is a focus on the north border increased as after 9-11 as opposed to the south border. Some of that was already occurring because of Quebec Gold and BC Bud in the drug area. Uh, some additional uh, human smuggling was starting to uh, have a little bit more focus on the north border. Um, what we are, are looking at in this subcommittee, we've had hearings, field hearings in the um, uh, Boston, uh, Montreal corridor. Uh, in Vermont, we've had one hearing in the Champlain in the New York uh, City, Montreal corridor. Uh, we, uh, on Monday, will be in Blaine, Washington, in the Seattle-Vancouver uh, corridor. We've also, uh, both those areas have water at Lake Champlain and Puget Sound, which are other places we can move. So we've worked with the Coast Guard. We also have Border Patrol facilities back from the border. We're going to some of the smaller sites as well as the larger sites. Uh, last uh, a week ago, Monday, we were in Ottawa and met with some of the legislators. One of the things that each of you are, are talking about, and I hope you will accelerate uh, those efforts to coordinate with Canada, because some of the diversion of resources from the south border to the north border may be able to be addressed by some cooperative arrangements with, with Canada. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions to start with that. Mr. Bonner, um, I, I applaud you for your statements that if uh, other nations do not give us their airline manifests, that they will be thoroughly searched, all carry-on and um, uh, uh, stowed uh, baggage um, immediately, rather than waiting. Um, because most Americans assume this was already happening. Has Canada moved forward on this as well? Well, the, uh, first of all, we have implemented a, a, a program. The Congress was uh, good enough to pass a law to make uh, it mandatory that advanced passenger information be provided to customs by all airlines. We had actually gotten this information over the past several years on a voluntary basis uh, 
for about 85 percent of the arriving passengers. But now it's mandatory, and as you know, Mr. Chairman, I've moved forward uh, promptly to implement that law, and uh, uh, we are getting uh, uh, virtually all the airlines, with the exception of a few now, are uh, uh, complying with the, the law, which will go into effect actually in a couple of months. We've had discussions with the Canadians about uh, advanced passenger information. They have, uh, I understand from my discussions with my counterpart at Canadian Customs and some of the political minister level people in Canada, that they have enacted legislation uh, so that uh, the appropriate agencies of the Canadian government will be getting advanced passenger information on flights into Canada from outside of Canada. Uh, we are working right now as we speak, Mr. Chairman, with, the, uh, with our Canadian counterparts, uh, both customs and at the political level, and with the, uh, the INS and uh, the CIC in Canada to get uh, a situation in which we have access or an ability to exchange advanced passenger information so that we can use that information uh, uh, both with respect to known uh, terrorist or individuals who are associated with terrorist organizations, but also use that information more effectively to identify those individuals that need to be uh, questioned further, to, to do some serious targeting of potential uh, terrorists that are entering our respective countries. So that's what we're working on with the, with the Canadians, which is both exchanging, getting a mechanism to exchange the information, and then working with them on both sides to develop uh, a more sophisticated way of, uh, uh, through targeting and using that information effectively to identify suspected terrorists. Ultimately, the end objective, if we can do it, would be to actually prevent boarding of aircraft by individuals who we do not want in the INS and Customs and the United States government does not want to enter the United States or to enter Canada. So these issues are uh, we're making some progress on them. Uh, they're, 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 you know, difficult issues. They have some, uh, some certainly some implications that, uh, uh, for the Canadians that we're working with and we're working through. And my, my sense is that we have a very, very high level of cooperation and support from our Canadian counterparts, uh, including at the various highest political levels of the Canadian government. Uh, to do this, which is not just with advanced passenger information, but also advanced manifest information and setting up systems so we're in a better position, both of our countries are in a better position to prevent terrorist or terrorist weapons from entering our respective uh, parts of North America. I agree with your assessment that they're, they seem very willing. Um, I also think it's important for uh, Americans to understand that terrorists go into our country to Canada as well, and a number of these people are moving back and forth uh, and, and so sharing. But I think it's um, also important in our hemisphere that um, I understand the need that they have to go through the processes, but you've taken direct action with a number of, of uh, other countries in the Middle East in particular immediately, and yet uh, in Montreal and in Toronto, uh, as you well know through your agency, at Port Angeles uh, location, a customs valiant warrior intercepted a uh, person headed for LAX airport that we are most vulnerable on our immediate borders and uh, Canada needs to respond rapidly. We need to first, if, because there is our biggest trade question. The second is how are the Mexican, how is Mexico working in the manifests uh, with our country? Yeah across the southwest border, we want to have the information and be able to share that with the Mexican government, our information, but get from them information as to who is arriving in the major international airports in Mexico, because uh, we want to be able to run them against the law enforcement databases in the United States. We also want to be able to do uh, some reasonably sophisticated targeting analysis to know who is, who is in th that zone as well. Uh, and the preliminary discussions are, are certainly encouraging, but we have, we have a ways to go with the government of Mexico to develop the actual exchange mechanism that will be needed. Thank you very much. Subcommittee is reconvened. Um, Mr. Ziegler has to... Uh, leave at 11.30.
And if others have particular engagements, if you can let me know too, we should have a period. And I know at least a few of the members are coming back and we'll submit some questions in writing. I uh, have quite a few, partly for the hearing record today and some related to our border report that we plan to be doing and uh, other ongoing uh, hearings. If I could, um, I want to suggest a, a few other things that, that we've already learned in our process of, of our, our hearings and in our meetings with the Canadian parliamentarians and talking to other members and encourage you each to look at this and we're going to be, we're going to be pursuing this uh, as we move through the, uh, at least the start of next year. Um, one thing is, and it was suggested actually in a couple of your, your testimonies of where at least in our hemisphere where we may be able, might be able to do joint operations to try to figure out how to balance the different missions. In other words, uh, we clearly heard the FBI has had an extraordinary diversion of, of resources over to the anti-terrorism demanded by the American people, uh, at least in the short term, and all of you have outlined some of those ways, and so we have to look for uh, some of the new efficiencies. Among those that um, have been alluded to here, and I would encourage to I expand. Uh, I talked to uh, Chairman uh, Wolf about this as, as well. In some of the less prominent border crossings, where we've had in the previous times maybe one person, it could be an INS person, it could be a customs person, um, and then only for part of a day. Now clearly we're doubling up, we're trying to keep these posts open 24 hours, and it's putting a strain on resources for very low traffic compared to say Buffalo and Detroit. Um, and to the degree we could explore uh, as we bring the laws similar to each other on immigration and on a number of the other things, which is why we're pushing Canada so hard, and if we can do this with Mexico and and be certain of some of the security at their borders, we could pursue it there possibly too, where um, the, there would only be one point for both countries and the staffing could even be alternated because we have to figure out a way to look at, uh, to do this cheaper vis-a-vis -vis the return. Another po point to the degree you can pre-clear on the uh, Canadian side, they may have more land. For example, the Ambassador Bridge, which carries more trade than all of the U.S.-Japan trade in the rest of the nation. Um, uh, we have a, a potential that as we look at new truck uh, monitoring places, can some of that be put on the Canadian side if we don't have the room on the American side? Because we're jamming up the bridges for miles going back and the border crossings for miles if we can't figure out how to do the clearances, uh, not only for uh, terrorism, but for increasing pressures on narcotics and immigration and other types of things. To the degree we can get some commonality in laws uh, at the border to look at creative ways to do that. I applaud and hope to you'll continue. All the agencies are working excellent. We visited a couple of, of, of places already and, and talked about some with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the joint uh, sharing at um, in the uh, northern border in the New York-Vermont area. There's actually an outpost where they're, they're shared. I hope we have more of those. And if I could ask another specific question of, of Mr. Bonner here. The Nexus system at uh, Sarnia and also uh, Port Huron and also some up at, at Blaine was moving ahead. It's a fast pass system. We've also, I believe, uh, experimented with that in San Isidro uh, a under a different name, uh, which is the other big uh, border crossing. Um, it was being tested at Port Huron and since Customs went to level one alert, it means that both the southern border counterpart Sentry and Nexus were suspended. Uh, in, it's been nearly three months. Clearly the terrorist alerts uh, we never get one off, but then we get another one, and we have another one on uh, right now. It's not clear when this is going to change. How, uh, at what point do you think the fast pass system will allow the frequent border crossers to, to work again, and what's the status with this uh, if we don't get off these terrorist alerts? Clearly that would uh, take care of a high percentage of the uh, uh, backups in Detroit. 
One story is reporting 1,400 nurses, and uh, my understanding was that there were 1,100 nurses who go back and forth, and the Detroit hospitals are having problems. Talking to Congresswoman Fitzpatrick, Kilpatrick from Detroit, where we're working on, and Susan Whalen on the Windsor side of the parliamentarian, this is a huge problem. The nursing, the trade, the trucks, some of the trucks go back and forth 17 times a day. Uh, in Indiana, some of our plants are having to shut down because they do, uh, or slow down because the parts go over to be assembled here, they come back, they get assembled another way, they go back again, and clearly the, the Nexus and Sentry things are the best way to clear out the regular traffic to move towards the, uh, so we can zero in on the higher risk traffic. You know, first of all, I think we ought to, if I could just start off by talking about wait times at the border just for a moment, because I think there is some misconception um, with respect to how, what the wait times are. Right after September the 11th, when uh, we went to level one alert, uh, we very shortly thereafter, on the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th of September, we saw 10 to 12 hour wait times uh, at, the, at Detroit, at the Ambassador Bridge, at Port Huron, at the bridges across through over to Buffalo. And it clearly was having an impact and the ability to, uh, particularly of the auto ma manufacturers and, and uh, U.S. industry in term that relies on a just-in-time inventory system in terms of being able to get parts and uh, in a timely way. Uh, we did take some immediate measures uh, uh, that first week, uh, working with the automobile manufacturers, uh, working with INS, working with uh, developing some initiatives that were opening more commercial lanes and keeping them staffed longer. We did get some National Guard assistance from uh, Governor Engler, which I requested and he provided promptly, uh, and taking other initiatives. And we did reduce the wait times by September 17th. By the next Monday or Tuesday, those wait times were down to around pre-September the 11th levels, and they have maintained uh, we've maintained a very high level of security, level one alert, and at the same time been able to get the trucks across the border, and by and large the passenger traffic across the northern border. But, Mr. Bonner, that's because there's been a 30 percent drop in yep. uh, commerce. The the uh, commerce, no, the, you know, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the commerce the commerce actually is back to the, the levels commerce. it was, but the passenger traffic, the commuter traffic, the tourist traffic. The POV, the privately owned vehicles, that is at about 60 to 70 percent of where it was before September the 11th. So they're definitely part of the reason, you're absolutely right, that the, we have been able to get the wait times down is that there's still a lot of passenger traffic that is not coming across that border. And if tomorrow we went back to full passenger traffic across the Ambassador Bridge and the Windsor Tunnel and Port Huron, we would probably be right back to where we are. So there is a definite crunch there. I don't want to say there isn't. But the first thing we have to understand is that the wait times uh, have been substantially reduced. I'm not saying they're acceptable, but they have been substantially reduced. There's still significant uh, decline in passenger vehicle traffic across the major ports in the northern border. And you have significant wait times at San Ysidro and in Arizona and Texas, particularly for passenger traffic. So there is impact for being at level one alert. Just, just saying that there has been some steps taken. Now part of that, uh, it seems to me, should include uh, where we can maintaining both security and uh, maintaining uh, the flow of trade across our respective border with Canada and frankly Mexico uh, is the twin objective here. We've got to maintain the security level but at the same time make sure that there's a, a, a smooth flow of commerce and uh, passenger vehicles. Uh, part of that, actually, I think, is reinstituting, if we can get appropriate security protection, reinstituting programs like Nexus at Port Huron, Port Huron Sarnia, and uh, the Sentry program, which is a similar program down in San Ysidro, to reinstitute those programs. As you know, those fast computer lane programs were for security reasons, they were terminated on September the 11th, and and that remains the case today. And we're uh, with INS. Actually, we're having discussions uh, as to the precise security levels that we would need for purposes of reopening uh, Nexus and uh, and other computer uh, com computer uh, commuter lane programs. And I do expect that we're going to be you know taking that up with. We've had some discussions, but we're going to be taking that up back up with our. Uh, our partners in Canada 
probably reasonably soon. But that we, we've got to make sure if we're resurrecting these programs that, uh, that they have a level of security that uh, is truly required to protect against the terrorist threat. Mr. Ziegler, bef before you go, do you, could, could you address um, that also in the Nexus uh, Century and also uh, any reaction you might have to where we might look at on these smaller, almost we can walk across uh, type of crossings where we might be able to do something joint with uh, Canadian Customs and Immigration? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, with respect to Nexus, uh, I, I think Rob has, has pretty much said it all. We are in, uh, we, we certainly are in agreement that we want to reopen Nexus. Um, we are discussing it with our Canadian counterparts. Uh, there are two or three uh, issues, as Rob pointed out, that we need to resolve with them. But uh, I feel very comfortable that even in a threat level, threat level one environment that we can we can still redeploy the nexus system um, with certain safeguards associated with it and I, I, I think we're in agreement on that yes, aren't we, Rob? I think so um, uh, with respect to um, some of these small ports uh, that um, uh, where we are now have we now have people there 24 hours a day one of the things that uh, people don't understand is that doesn't mean that we're keeping those ports open 24 hours a day. We just simply have people there 24 hours a day to guard the, the place so that there isn't passage. Uh, an alternative to uh, having uh, this situation where you've got people there is to harden those ports, to make it uh, literally physically impossible to pass them uh, as opposed to having a human presence there. Uh, and I think you can harden those uh, during those periods of time when the port is not going to be open anyway as an alternative. Now, certainly uh, working with the Canadians, and they, like, you, like we talked about earlier, they are extremely cooperative uh, on a lot of issues now. Uh, I think we probably could work out an arrangement like that. But there are some issues that are very sensitive with respect to um, having one or the other um, presence on, on the side of the border, for example, um, their gun laws are very different than ours. And having our agents on, on their side of the uh, border uh, creates some problems for them. These are things that we have to work out. But uh, the, the idea that, that uh, we were not working with the Canadians before September 11th is one I, I sure want to dispel because there are a number of things that we've been doing with Canadians over a number of years, both between uh, the Canadian Immigration and INS uh, Customs and their Customs and then all four of us together. Uh, the IBETS teams, for example, the uh, Joint um, uh, Passenger Analysis Units, which we're going to s s start expanding. Um, the, um, um, for example, uh, we have um, in, uh, immigration control officers overseas where we've worked together with them. Uh, this is kind of an immigration thing, but it helps customs. We're going to expand the number of Im immigration control officers at um, airports and seaports overseas so that we can interdict people over there. Uh, and we're going to do this jointly, and we're going to do joint training of airlines. Uh, so the Canadians and the Americans or the United States folks, they're Americans too, North America, um, the, uh, they, um, uh, they have really been very cooperative uh, and we're finding a, a very good working relationship. And I think there's a, a much broader strategy that, uh, that Governor Ridge uh, is putting together. Um, the things that Rob has done with, with Customs and what we've done with their immigration uh, folks just in the last few weeks uh, fit together into a bigger matrix that Governor Ridge is, is putting together. And so I, I think you're going to see some very promising uh, cooperative efforts on, on both sides of the border. With the, the cost of the new equipment to do the screening for, uh, if we start trying to look for anthrax, we look for bombs, we look for, uh, in addition to uh, whether we try to get uh, uh, fingerprint or eye technology for for illegals. Uh, the truck port equipment is going to be so high to be able to also get that equipment for drugs and and uh, anti-drugs uh, screening and other types of things. It's not clear that we can 
can duplicate facilities on both sides right. and the degree we can cross train not only among our agents but among them if in going one direction you're looking for this going the other direction you're looking for that clearly and even different regions have in, in Vermont they were looking for smuggling of cheese because that's mm -hmm. uh, milk products are a huge <laughs> issue in in Vermont uh, other areas it's it's uh, uh, well Cuban cigars are obviously something that comes across the other direction to, uh, for, to us uh, and, and those type of peculiarities, I think we could uh, try to deal with those. Mr. Ziegler, when Mr. you... Mr. Chairman, I, I just make one comment yeah. about that. Uh, certainly on uh, small consumer items that where we have joint jurisdiction at the border, that the cost of that equipment is something that we all have to share. But when you get to that cargo and that heavy stuff, that's out of Rob's budget. <laughs> Thanks. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, very, um, I'm very pleased to be here, and I apologize for having to leave, um, but as you know, I... Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I just add, Mr. Chairman, if I could, that we are uh, working with Governor Ridge in terms of some of the very proposals that you're you're talking about, and uh, I think I think the governor actually plans to go up to Ottawa perhaps next week, and we, we hope to make some real progress on some of these issues with our Canadian partners. Mr. Owens, did you want to ask any questions? I'm sorry, I'm delayed, but. And sorry, I missed Mr. Uh, Ziegler. Uh, I uh, just wanted to comment in terms of the large numbers of immigrants I, rec I represent in the 11th Congressional District uh, in, in New York. And I uh, particularly want Mr. Ziegler to hear, so I'd like to go on the record. And that is that uh, I have a large Caribbean community uh, in my district in New York. Uh, and. Uh, I have a large Pakistani community, much smaller than the Caribbean community, but uh, uh, I'm concerned about both groups and about the general uh, profiling of immigrants. I'm always against profiling <clears throat> and generalizations about any category of people. But uh, <clears throat> being in the real world, I know that some profiling, since you have limited resources, is going to take place. But in the process of doing that, I think the record should clearly show <clears throat> that throughout the history of the United States, uh, two world wars, uh, Vietnam, Korea, uh, you have never had a situation where any people of Caribbean descent have been caught up in any espionage or in any way uh, been uh, terrorists. Uh, it just no, no history whatsoever there. In fact, the largest percentage of people now being uh, recruited for the United States Armed Services in, in New York comes out of the immigrant uh, Caribbean community. Uh, people are going into the armed services, you know, uh, and uh, to have a blanket suspicion of immigrants and blanket policies being applied so that a young Jamaican student who has been admitted to college already and they're paying, giving her a scholarship, we had a difficult, difficult time trying to get her into the country, uh, because of the, the, the tightened uh, restrictions and the, the, the general atmosphere, uh, which is anti-immigrant. In the case of the Pakistanis, it's even more serious because they are Muslims and uh, profiling against Muslims results in ridiculous kinds of situations where there were sweeping, FBI sweeps of certain parts of the Pakistani community. As many as 200 people were, were uh, rounded up in the New York area who were Pakistanis. And not a single one has been identified by the FBI as having any connection with terrorists. However, quite a number had problems with their visas. They stayed too long, or various problems. And they, they were being held by an S uh, for some reason. Uh, some held as long as three or four weeks. And one man died in custody. And uh, I just think that kind of uh, treatment and the assumption that uh, all Muslims uh, must be treated in the same way, and then the failure to at least exercise discretion as the immigration services director has discretion if people are found to have overstayed their visas. They don't have to hold them in detention. There are ways, if they, they're ready to go home, they've been caught, they're willing to go home. Uh, there have been many ways that we've dealt with that in the past in terms of giving them a chance to, to go home and post bond or whatever. And uh, the uh, atmosphere was such that nobody wanted to be reasonable about it. So they were put in jails, contracted with the county of New Jersey, and, and uh, treated very badly. Now, and following that, they even arrested some women. And, 
and as of last week, we're still detaining some women without uh, giving us a good explanation for it. So I, I hope that uh, we will keep our perspective. Uh, there are some kind of ridiculous things that are happening as we label all immigrants as being possible enemies. Uh, I don't like the fact that in the airport security bill that we passed, uh, we made it uh, a condition that any person who becomes a, an employee of the federal government under that bill has to be a citizen. Uh, and uh, before, in the earlier drafts, it said they, they have to be a citizen or permanent resident for five years. And then it, it, when the final bill was passed, it, they had to be a citizen. Now, to say that anybody who works in the airport security uh, operation has to be a citizen, while at the same time we are accepting large numbers of people into the armed services of the United States who are not citizens, you only have to be a permanent resident to, to become a part of the United States Armed Services. We're going to send people out to fight for us and be a part of our armed services who are not citizens, and yet we cannot uh, allow people who are here and uh, permanent residents to take the airport security jobs. I think that's part of a manifestation of a spirit of anti-immigrant spirit that, that, that we should try to counteract. And also, at all times, remember, certainly in this hemisphere, uh, we have partners in this hemisphere that have always been there for us. All the Caribbean countries, most South American countries, I mean, uh, those immigrants and their countries certainly deserve some kind of special consideration in terms of, of our hemisphere uh, partnership, and I hope we'll, we'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I regret I had to be at another meeting as well. Um, Director Hutchinson, uh, can you tell me about the, uh, we heard quite a bit about how much uh, heroin had been warehoused by the Afghanistans and we had talked to the Defense Department about trying to eliminate that warehouse. Did we do any good, do you know, in trying to get rid of all the inventory they had piled up? Of course, the, uh, uh, I think some of the inventory, significant part of the inventory was released of their own will to uh, sell it. Uh, in regard to uh, our operations, uh, I wouldn't want to comment in this forum about uh, what the military may or may not be targeting, but I do want to assure you that uh, at their request, we do have uh, DEA uh, personnel there in Tampa uh, working with them on a day-to-day -day basis as to uh, sharing with them the intelligence that we gather uh, on locations and other information that might be helpful to their operation. So uh, uh, as they, uh, the military uh, carries out additional responsibilities in Afghanistan, after we take care of the terrorism issue, I certainly hope that uh, the issues you raise will be addressed. Well, I appreciate that. I know they neatly stack their inventory close to a mosque for protection purposes, and I hope we can get uh, that uh, taken care of as well. Uh, and uh, speaking about Afghanistan, since we're going to have an opportunity now to be in there, I hope that we can encourage some substitute crops uh, throughout the growing area uh, as an uh, alternative to the production they had in the north and also in the south. Uh, you're absolutely correct, uh, Congressman Gilman, that uh, that has to be a part of any long-term strategy. Uh, the uh, very similar to s the crop substitution programs that have, you have been an advocate for uh, in South America. Uh, certainly the international community needs to support that in Afghanistan. Uh, we uh, are in discussions with the State Department and I know that these plans are, are being uh, laid out for uh, what we need to do in Afghanistan later on. It's encouraging to hear, hear that. Since we will be if pretty much have an opportunity to do some important things in Afghanistan. This is a great opportunity for us to try to get rid of that heroin crop that's been plaguing all of our nations. Uh, 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 Commissioner uh, uh, Bonner, uh, your uh, organization's been doing outstanding work. How are we doing controlling the border with Canada and the New York State uh, border there where we have the Mohawk reservations along the border and which become almost a, a safe harbor for anyone getting on a reservation. Are we, have we worked out anything with regard to that? You know, I, I know uh, 
Mr. Gilman, that <clears throat> the, the whole issue of security at our northern border has been one that uh, has obviously consumed a lot of my time uh, since being sworn in as commissioner about September 24th, I guess a little over two months ago. Uh, I, I think we need to do a number of things that uh, uh, to better secure our northern border. I mean, one of them, of course, we've been talking about, which is working with our Canadian partners in terms of ratcheting up the kind of information exchange and sharing and uh, benchmarking our own security measures. But one of the things we need to do, I think, uh, or at least one of the things I'm thinking of, uh, is you know making sure that we have, with respect to the the low volume ports of entry, uh, uh, that we, we have some ability to uh, harden the, those ports of entry and secure them so they don't have to be staffed 24 hours a day. And then we need to be concerned with what I would call the between ports of entry issue, which by the way uh, is primarily a responsibility, as you know, Mr. Gilman, of the Border Patrol. But we need to have some capability of doing that and uh, one thing that we might look at in trying to leverage limited resources of the custom service and the INS is to and perhaps have the Canadians join in this but is to develop joint uh, response teams in other words you would have some monitoring of both between ports of entry places like the Mohawk Reservation, uh, like uh, essentially unofficial road crossings from the Canadian border, particularly uh, uh, in uh, upstate New York and uh, Vermont and, 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 uh, and through Maine, uh, and that we would have some uh, joint response capability by a response team that would be made up of perhaps, I'm just speaking now, this is not uh, certainly any official position of the administration, but would be joint teams made up of perhaps Border Patrol, Customs Agents, state and local law enforcement, so that we'd have some response capability to not just, uh, and, and, and if, and I think there actually is some chance that we would get the Canadians actually to participate in this. It's kind of the, the IBET model that we used in British Columbia that we set up with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Customs and, and INS using that model so that we're also leveraging the resources of our Canadian counterparts and we have some sort of response capability which would be censoring, monitoring and response capability to the intrusion of terrorists or uh, individuals that are bringing in terrorist weapons or attempting to bring in terrorist weapons into the United States. Is there anything we so can that do? would include the Mohawk Reservation, although that's a very special issue because yeah. uh, uh, it is a it is a reservation. Can we do anything by some agreement with the Mohawks uh, for anyone coming onto their reservation? You know, I think one of the things that we've done, as you know, on the southern border, we also have a reservation issue, and we actually have uh, special enforcement officers of the Customs Service that are uh, that are Indians, and I mean they do one hell of a job on the that southern could, border. So they're maybe taking very helpful. That Taking that model and seeing if we can't do that on the northern border. With I hope you would explore that. I will, sir. And uh, let me ask our, our good uh, Admiral uh, uh, Lo uh, Admiral Loy with regard to our Coast Guard. I've been hearing some talk that the budget has been cut back quite a bit. Uh, can you tell us about where you stand on your request in the budget process? Are you being taken care of or not being taken care of? So I can say that uh, uh, the transportation bill just passed. Uh, the uh, President's request was, uh, uh, was granted by the Congress uh, with respect to the normal appropriation for the year, but of course that was all pre-9-11 thinking, as you know, in terms of the, the So you're still there. short. Well, the supplemental is the key to success for us for the rest of O2, and uh, unfortunately, on the uh, uh, on the House action side of the uh, of the president's requested supplemental, we were cut about sixty million dollars. We hope to be able to recover that by the time uh, the Senate is done acting and we find our way through conference. But that is a significant challenge for us at this particular point, and we would like to think that the Congress would be able to support the President's requested uh, level for us in the supplemental. Of $60 million extra. Uh, that was the cut on the House side oh, as you. the uh, bill went forward as a uh, 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 attached to the uh, DOD appropriates bill. Um, Mr. Gallagher, uh, with regard to the FBI, there's the article today in the Washington Post showing, uh, describing massive redeployment of FBI agents away from drug enforcement, investigation of street crimes, bank problems. 
Um, are we neglecting those areas? We're responding to the events of 9-11 the same way that we have to other incidents, although this is being uh, one, a lot larger than ones that we've had in the past. When we had the Oklahoma City bombing in that area, we did the same thing, where we diverted resources from all of our other programs to address that. Uh, as I mentioned in my statement, our resources are slowly coming back to where we are working uh, on the traditional criminal violations. Uh, we're back at about 55 percent of where we, where we were pre-9-11 in working the traditional criminal violations. Um, one of the things that we are doing is that agents have been working a lot longer uh, and a lot more hours of, uh, of each day and more days during the week to try to make sure that certainly the most significant cases that we have are continuing to move forward. Those that are ready for prosecution will continue being prosecuted. Uh, those cases that we're working in conjunction uh, with other partners where we can, uh, we have tried to continue in some areas. We've had to pull people away from uh, certain task forces or cut back some of our commitments to those task forces. But one of the things that the director has been very clear on is that he wants to ensure that we continue our commitment to our partners, whether they be other federal, state, or local partners, in ensuring our cooperation with them. So that when you reassign uh, your agents, there is a local agency that moves in and takes over so that there isn't a vacuum? It depends on what you're talking about, sir. Uh, if you're talking about uh, bank robberies, for example, if we don't respond to a bank robbery in most areas, there is still the local police who will respond to that bank robbery. Uh, it's a question of, of who has what capacity. Certainly in some of the uh, smaller or more rural locales, uh, our assistance is a lot more important to them in responding to something like bank robberies than it would be in New York City, where they have thousands of police officers who can respond to, uh, to bank robberies. Um, it, it will vary across the country as to what we're doing and, and where, we have, where we have pulled resources from. But generally speaking, we are still trying to respond to the most violent of crimes and the biggest uh, organized crime and drug cases and white-collar crime cases that we have uh, going right now. Well, that's reassuring. I want to thank our agency uh, heads who are here, the admiral and the directors, commissioners, for the good work you're doing. And I hope you will keep our committee informed if there is any shortage of uh, vital funds so that we can explore that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gallagher. I just want to follow up on some of Mr. Gilman's, um, the last few questions that he was asking. Uh, we all were uh, provided with a copy of uh, Washington Post article dated today. I'm sure you've seen it. FBI's focus on terrorism, sidelines, other categories of crime. Are you familiar with that article? Uh, I've seen it since I've been here to this morning, sir. Seems to be a, a relatively well-balanced article where they try to give both sides of the um, situation. Um, one of the things that uh, that happened in Baltimore, yeah, we have a, a very high uh, murder rate, and we'd been bringing it down steadily. And when the mayor began, since September 11th, the mayor had to uh, pull resources, uh, being so close to Washington, uh, pull resources to address this whole September 11th tragedy and the threats coming in. And what we've noticed is that our murder rate is has gone up steadily. Um, and it's the theory of some people that the even if it's only in the minds of the criminal folk, they believe that resources are being shifted to deal with this, because everything they see on the news is, you know, policemen assigned to the port, policemen assigned to this and that, that they can now uh, commit their crimes and uh, might be able to avoid uh, punishment or being caught and being caught. And I guess, I guess the thing that, that concerns me, and I'm sure it concerns you, we don't even want to put that idea out there um, that folk 
can get away with something because we're going through this process. And that leads me to the question of, you know, with regard to resources, um, do you feel, I mean, the President has said, and I think the, the country agrees with him, that this is a long-term effort. Um, this is not like the situation that happened in Oklahoma, although very extremely tragic. You, 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 could, you could kind of put a box around and say, this is it. Here, you know, we, we're getting these threats. We just got one the other day. And I'm just wondering, do you feel that you all have the necessary resources for this ongoing effort? Because some of your shop, I'm sure, some people in your shop, you know, although you're back to the 55% point, I think you said, um, there's some people that have got to be able to respond, and we're going to continue to have these little, not these these incidents of threats and whatever. But they've got to. They, I guess they have to be on high alert almost 24/7. So I'm just wondering, do you do you feel that you have the resources that you need to address the problems uh, as the president has laid them out? Well, the 2002 budget was just approved for us, and we also, I think, received a few additional resources as a result of the counterterrorism supplemental legislation. Um, but insofar as our overall picture as to whether or not we're going to need additional resources, uh, I'm not trying to duck your question, Congressman, but we are in the process of doing this uh, complete and comprehensive analysis of what we're going to be doing in the future. And I think it might be premature for me to try to say right now specifically what we think we might need in the future until the directors had an opportunity to fully evaluate these facts. Well, uh, I, I appreciate that. The, one of the reasons why we are holding this, this, this hearing, I think, is that we had some local folk who came in uh, and uh, Administrator Hutchinson was there, and they talked about local, and these are local folk who were talking about how they were being stretched and they were, you know, they didn't have the resources that they needed and all that kind of thing. And at the same time, you said it, and this article also says that what you are doing is relying on the local people. And at some point, something's got to give. I mean, our, sadly, in Baltimore, for example, we've got a situation where we've already broken our budget and we don't know where the money is going to come from. We, uh, there's an article in the Sun paper today saying we were going to get some $56 million for the state. Well, in Baltimore City, we're probably already about 15 or $20 million over where we're supposed to be. So I guess the question becomes, um, you know, where does it give? I mean, if, if these guys are saying they're stretched, and you're stretched, and I don't know about Mr. Hutchinson, they refer to his agency in this article. Uh, one, somebody said that the, that uh, use an example that when there are problems maybe in your area that the DEA kind of chips in and you all kind of work together. But at some point, it's like a balloon and you keep putting air in it and you keep putting air in it and something's going to burst. And I guess, you know, and, 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 and I, my local people are crying for resources and begging. So I, I guess, you know, th th that's why I ask these questions. I'm just concerned. And I don't, and, and this committee, this subcommittee uh, has the mission of addressing the drug problem, but I don't want the folk in Baltimore, the drug dealers, to get the impression that the FBI, the DEA, Baltimore City Police, Maryland State Police, are so busy dealing with, and, and rightfully so, dealing with the terrorism thing, that they can then get away with their thing. So, and then the question is, you know, have we accomplished much with regard to our domestic situation? And that really concerns me. If, if it were not for the situation, like I said, where I saw, I mean, I actually see this every day. Our murder rate goes ste going steadily up. The more we talked about terrorism, the more the murder rate came, uh, went up. And now it looks like we are going to, we had gotten it below 300 uh, a year or so ago. It looks like we may hit 300 or go above. So I, I, I guess, you know, I'm just trying to, maybe I'm just frustrated. But I just wanted you to, to hear that because I think there are jurisdictions all over the country that are saying the same thing. We want to cooperate. We want to be patriotic. We want to be supportive of our, of our president. But at the same time, we also need resources. And so when you say that you, you're leaning on them, I'm trying to figure out, well, you know, what do they have so that, I mean, 
to prop themselves up so that when you're leaning on them in your time of stress, how do they even survive? And maybe you may want to address that, Mr. Hutchinson. I don't know. I mean. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. And uh, uh, you're correct. We want to send the, exactly the right signal to uh, the traffickers that there's not any uh, letdown in our uh, investigations and commitment uh, to the a broad arena of law enforcement and the FBI has done an extraordinary job uh, in terms of uh, uh, committing the resources where they need to be and I know that in many instances uh, they're able to come back to uh, the task force of the counter narcotics mission but they're clearly uh, stretched thin. In reference to DEA uh, we are focused uh, you know we are a single mission agency and we're focused on our counter narcotics mission and in every instance that we can, we want to work closely with the FBI and, and our local law enforcement to make sure that there's not any slack. I think that, uh, uh, you know, Director Mueller uh, has uh, indicated uh, under the Attorney General's guidance, uh, you know, willingness to uh, look at it. And, and my colleague here indicates that they're in the process of it. So I would agree that it's really premature for uh, either the DEA or the FBI to uh, jump in the middle of that subject waiting for uh, that review to be completed. Uh, thank you. I just have a, a few more questions, but I, I think part of what we're trying to do with this hearing, and it's a delicate balance, is to acknowledge that uh, there is a confusion too among the American people when we say we're diverting resources over to fight terrorism where did those resources come from? Uh, clearly, your agents weren't just sitting home doing nothing. Uh, and we don't want to give that impression either that we had a whole bunch of excess agents that we could all of a sudden put over to terrorism. And uh, our difficult political uh, problem is how to work out these priorities with your guidance without having what we're seeing happen. And that is, people are dying on the streets of drugs and we're chasing anthrax which could be a problem we have six deaths there where in the murder rate in one month in Philadelphia went up 50 percent after September 11th because people were diverted over to um, chasing anthrax scares and among other things and their police chief and others are complaining about it it's happening in city after city and that we're uh, where, where our fears get heightened and then we're going to come back. This, this subcommittee now has jurisdiction over HHS. When I was on a different subcommittee here, a vice chairman, we did seven hearings on health care fraud. Obviously, if most of the FBI is being diverted over, or many of the FBI agents are being diverted over to counterterrorism, what happens to health care fraud? Uh, next year we're likely to be in a panic about the economy, bluntly put, uh, in this, this Congress if, if we don't um, uh, have some sort of economic recovery, and then we're going to be going, uh-oh, what are we doing about uh, Social Security? What are we doing about uh, commerce on the borders? What are we doing about this or that? And we'll be calling you in here saying, how come you diverted all your people over there and the fisheries are falling apart? And we have uh, 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 illegal goods in transit coming across and, and different immigrants. I, I want to finish with just a few specific questions. Beyond, that's what we're trying to get at. Now, all this, it shouldn't give anybody who's doing illegal activities the idea and we're going to find some synergism but we're going to have to figure out uh, whether or not it works better to have it consolidated among borders <clears throat> whether to eliminate some of the duplication that we see among agencies uh, we can't have everybody just spend more time in joint agency task force meetings because then everybody's in meetings instead of out on the on the street Admiral Loy I wanted to get to, into a couple specifics on the, the Coast Guard um, Without additional supplemental, is it true you'll have to work on a 15% reduction in the 2002 budget? Yes, sir. There's a uh, uh, specific line item in the 02 normal appropriation that called for a 15% capability reduction for the organization for fiscal year 02. Uh, the $60 million I spoke of just a minute ago in uh, answering Mr. Gilman's question uh, is a recovery of that 15% capability across the full scope of the organization's wherewithal to do not only counterterrorism, but all the other things we're responsible for as well. Um, how, um, let me ask you a specific example. Is it true that the Navy has loaned the Coast Guard six coastal patrol boats and that the Florida National Guard is protecting two Florida seaports because you don't have the resources there? And can, how long can Sir, that continue? I, I wouldn't make quite the uh, immediate cause and effect there. Uh, let me answer the question this way. Uh, 
We've been working very hard uh, with Governor Ridge's office to develop a maritime security game plan as a piece of the total border security game plan. Uh, I believe that to be an all-hands evolution, sir. Uh, this is not okay. where the Coast Guard uh, on the uh, stewardship of the American taxpayer is going to go be all things to all people in all of the seaports of the United States. Uh, so part of our challenge, once as, as we have developed this maritime security game plan, is to broadcast that all-hands evolution notion. Uh, one of the first calls I got on the, on the 11th or 12th of September was from Admiral Clark, the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, making certain that I understood, that he understood, the national fleet policy that we've built over the last several years is a two-way street. And when it's appropriate for me to send things and competencies and expertise to him for his work over there, it's equally important where he has the wherewithal, like patrol craft, like naval coastal warfare kinds of assets, that if I need them in the harbor defense seaport security world of work here in the United States on this new front, uh, he is more than willing to send them in our direction. Uh, the other people that we've outreached to are other federal agencies, and as, uh, as Rob has already mentioned here this morning, we have worked uh, uh, diligently with both the Customs Service and INS to think how best we can serve each other in this collective effort uh, not only about homeland security, but about getting all the other work done as well. Uh, we think it's a good thing for us to forge an MOU between us to outline those areas of, uh, if there are areas of overlap, to encourage the committee to see where those are uh, and challenge us to be more efficient and more effective on those, uh, on those gaps. But we're also reaching to state and locals. Uh, uh, Mr. Cummings, as your, uh, as your commentary is absolutely right on point. Uh, we're also reaching to the private sector. We have had engagements with 50 or 60 trade associations, getting them to understand that in the ports and harbors of the United States, largely privately owned, if there is to be a greater security profile there, it will be made up of Coast Guard contributions, other federal agency contributions, state and local contributions, and private sector contributions. And it will be the net higher security profile that will give us what we need uh, in this all-hands evolution that I speak of. Is, it, is the Coast uh, Integrated Deep Water System still a priority of the Coast Guard? It is, <coughs> and uh, if so, why? It is absolutely so. <coughs> uh, the, the events of the 11th of September simply have provided yet another set of reasons why that particular project, funded well, as a matter of fact, by the Transportation Bill this year uh, by the Congress, uh, is enormously important. That what, what's at the hub of that project is, as we call it, C4ISR, the command and control intelligence uh, surveillance reconnaissance kind of things that will enable us to be infinitely better um, uh, as a hub of the operations that go on in seaports. We bridge to the DOD side because we're a military service. We bridge to the law enforcement community because we're a law enforcement agency. The, the deep water project, in addition to those assets that it will do for us what we want in the exclusive economic zone and around the world, the hub of it is better interoperability capability, which will be enormously uh, helpful for us in prosecuting our work in the ports and harbors of America. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. <clears throat> um, how much do the counterterrorism and the other missions overlap? For example, um, when you inspect vehicles and travelers for bombs or other weapons, is that compatible with tracking for narcotics? Yes, it is. So uh, certainly from the inspection side, the customs inspection side, there's a uh, there's very much overlap, and it's very complementary. I mean, when you're searching for uh, for implements of terror, uh, you're you're searching for any kind of contraband, and that includes drugs, and and uh, that may be smuggled across the border. And that's why I think you had the initial effects that I described in my my earlier testimony, and that was initially when we went to level one alert at the uh, the southwest border and uh, and the uh, the northern border with Canada. Uh, we actually saw at the southwest border, I mean, still a large amount of drugs coming into the United States, come in across the Mexican border. We saw uh, that evaporate. I mean, our seizures went way down, and it was because, in my judgment, traffickers were holding their product and were concerned that they were being, would take unacceptable risk of having their product seized. We've seen that, by the way, in the last month reverse. They've, they've had to get their product to market. and. It, Drug seizures have gone up as a result of our uh, level one alert, uh, particularly at the southwest border. Uh, they're up 30 percent from uh, October of this year compared to October of last year. So those are complementary. 
where it's not exactly complementary is on the agent side of the house because our special agents are also involved through Operation Green Quest and uh, Operation Shield America that I described in what are essentially anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism efforts using our investigative jurisdiction to uh, uh, help uh, prevent uh, terrorist organizations, international terrorist organizations from being able to perpetrate terrorist acts in the United States or frankly elsewhere. Now that has had an effect. It has not had an effect so far on our ability to uh, work drug investigations for our special agents. Many times we do this, as you know, with our DEA colleagues. But it has had some impact on our ability to, uh, our investigative cases with respect to intellectual property rights, uh, knockoffs of products. It's, it's had some impact on that area. It's also had some impact on our ability to pursue fraud cases, uh, customs fraud cases, sometimes involving falsification of the uh, country of origin and so forth. Uh, so there are some, you know, there, there, there is some robbing Peter to pay Paul that's going on here to maintain our terrorist, uh, our, our, our posture against the terrorist threat at the Customs Service and at the same time uh, perform the many other very enforcement, uh, very important enforcement missions that the Customs Service has. I think the American people would <coughs> rather be alive than dead, which is part of the hierarchy. On the other hand, if they're alive but don't have a job because we've had the patents stolen, it does present a problem. We're going to have to uh, face those. Have you lost many agents to Sky Marshals or other parts of the... Well, you know, like DEA and other agencies, we have 125 uh, special agents who are in the, what, what I'd call the temporary Sky Marshal program. But as you know, that's about 18 months, I'm told, before we could expect to have those agents back. Uh, I don't think we've had uh, the kind of uh, attrition of, uh, of our customs inspectors, uh, at least so far, to the Sky Marshal program that uh, Commissioner Ziegler was talking about in terms of the Border Patrol. But I'm certainly concerned uh, that, uh, you know, to maintain the, the level of security and, uh, uh, and the, uh, that what we're doing right now, uh, I mean, could well result in, in, in burnout. And I'm very concerned about this in terms of particularly our customs inspectors who are really, uh, you know, they are busting their, uh, their fannies to protect America against the terrorist threat. Part, by the way, just so you know, part of the temporary solution to that, uh, if we can get the funding for it, would be to bring in National Guard to assist customs inspectors at, uh, at the northern border and the southern border as well, to assist in uh, secondary uh, examinations, to assist us in pre-screening so we can keep that traffic flowing. But that's a temporary solution. Ultimately, you have to back that up with both people and technology to do the inspections and the examinations that we need to do for the terrorist, uh, to, for the counter-terrorism uh, effort, and for uh, also to maintain the drug interdiction uh, posture that I think is, you know, a very important part of what the U.S. Customs Service does. Admiral, if I might just add a comment, sir. Uh, uh, about 20 percent of our uh, of our special agents have been involved in the Sky Marshal program as well. Uh, and any of us in this room who thinks uh, that we will not have to deal with a head count, an equipment count, and an asset count, count upgrade in order for these agencies to do what is necessary, uh, especially if the notion is that we have to go back to the same level of dedication that we were to those missions prior to the 10th of September and deal with a heightened profile of, uh, uh, in our case, port security and, and, in, and all the other uh, 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 agencies' cases, their contribution to homeland security. Uh, uh, it, it's just the wrong script to be reading. It will be a head count, equipment count, uh, and asset count kind of a solution in part, as well as finding the efficiencies that we can find where, uh, where those overlaps occur. Mr. Cummings? I just have a, just two or three questions. First of all, let me say this, Admiral Loy. I want to uh, I hope you'll pass this on to the folks that address the Port of Baltimore. They've done an outstanding job. Thank you. Uh, every single report that I've gotten, we've done, we do a lot of briefings in the Baltimore area about the port, but they say that they've received maximum cooperation with the Coast Guard, from the Coast Guard, and I just wanted to make sure that you knew that. I will pass um, that on. But you all, the last uh, chairman's question that just leads me to this, and I. I wonder what are we doing to uh, 
retain, <clears throat> retain the good people who are in the agencies and looking to the future since we have got this long-term thing. I think we, our, ch our country has changed since September 11th. So how do we, I mean, are you all looking, uh, at, uh, Commissioner Barney, you were just talking about uh, burnout and whatever. Are we looking, you know, say five years, two years, and I know it's, you may think it's early, but we, 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 we gotta make sure we've got troops to deal with with this new realization, security realization that has happened since September 11th. And I'm just wondering, is that part of you all's planning process? Are you looking at how to retain, how to recruit more people, those kinds of things? And is, is that a part of your planning process? Well, it, it definitely is because, uh, you know, I think in terms of planning, we have to make the assumption, I think it's the correct assumption right now, that the, the terrorist threat against our country is going to go on long past the fall of the Taliban the death of bin Laden, it's going to, we're talking about the foreseeable future, we're talking about years, not months, as the President has said. And so, uh, on the one level, we have a, a very, a fairly large number of people that have been pre-cleared, the background checks have been done, to become into the Customs Service as inspectors and as special agents. So we have a pool that we're ready to bring in, send down to training, as you know, there's some rollout time here. Uh, the, the training taking uh, 12 to 16 months uh, at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and to deploy those uh, effectively where we need to deploy them, which, by the way, is northern border and it is the major seaports in terms of containers coming into the United States. The, it's very important that we, uh, obviously, we have highly trained uh, and experienced both inspectors and special agents, so we, we certainly uh, uh, it's very important that we be able to uh, uh, retain uh, the good people that we have in the Customs Service and we're, we're obviously thinking about ways of doing that. But I, I can tell you this, uh, Mr. Cummings, that you know, if, you're, if you're consistently over a long period of time putting extraordinary demands on people, no matter how dedicated they are, and the men and women of the Customs Service are phenomenally dedicated, uh, still, uh, that's not the way you, you keep people uh, uh, in, uh, it ret retained in their job. You've got to, we've got to provide them with uh, the relief, and that's both through staffing so that, uh, that these extraordinary amounts of overtime can be reduced, and that's in terms of improving our technology so that we're actually doing and capable of doing the inspections and examinations that we need to do to maintain security, uh, but at the same time, being able to do that faster, move move trade and move commerce, move people across our border. So uh, obviously, I, I, there's more work being done on that. We're we're, we're studying uh, various issues that affect the Customs Service in terms of retention issues uh, that include everything from potentially 6C status for uh, uh, for inspectors to. Uh, what the journeyman grade should be and so forth. Uh, I have, by the way, that, that's under study. I am not in a position today to tell you what, uh, exactly how that will come out. And obviously, uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, uh, I think is best, I'm going to have to pursue that within the, through the Department of the Treasury and within the administration and OMB and the like. I, I understand. I want to just make sure it's on the drawing board. I mean, it's something that is, you know, that we are looking, looking in that direction. Uh, did you all, anybody else? Uh, let me just uh, comment, Mr. Cummings, that uh, you're absolutely correct in the DEA. Uh, morale is high, uh, we're, <clears throat> but we always want to look to the future to make sure that we're able to retain. Within the agency, we're looking at some quality of life issues. Uh, the strain that uh, uh, Commissioner Bonner's referred to uh, exists in, in uh, the DEA as well in terms of uh, uh, the uh, requirements of the job and, and the hours. And so we want to do what we can within the agency to make sure that uh, we can give them the relief that's needed to make sure they don't have the burnout over the long time. And, then, uh, and secondly, it clearly is a, a resource issue as well uh, that we have to be able to have the uh, uh, capability of relief and uh, so that they can have uh, a long tenure and not uh, simply uh, move to the private sector at, uh, at an opportune moment. So thank you for the asking question. Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I could be excused, uh, I've got to uh, head to another engagement. I, I apologize. We appreciate all the time you spent. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll just 
you can go ahead and, and go. I just want to make a concluding comment that I hope each of you communicate. Admiral Lloyd, did you want to comment if, on the first I, I just need to make one point, sir, with respect to a military workforce as opposed to the, uh, to the other workforces. Uh, uh, we are working diligently with the Congress. The Congress has been very generous after some administrative uh, 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 proposals in the course of the last several Congresses uh, to deal with quality of life issues for the military workforces, not just the Coast Guard, but all five. Uh, that reality is a wonderful thing, uh, but there remains a, a gap between uh, military pay scales and uh, civilian scales in general. Uh, and uh, to, to the degree there is a monetary reward notion associated with retention and recruiting and, a, and continued service in uniform, uh, that should not be lost on the Oversight Committee as well as on those committees that have to deal with those things in an appropriations manner as, the, as they go through. Uh, these young kids that are out there that uh, Mr. Cummings was just very kind to uh, compliment in, in, in Baltimore, uh, their gratification, I guarantee you, is that they are doing something patriotic and of value to their country, but at the other end of the day, if we have not dealt with their quality of life along the way, uh, they will put their time in and they will find another place to go. Uh, we are very concerned about both retention and recruiting. Uh, since the 11th of September, we've watched numbers very carefully in terms of whether or not there's been an uptick, for example, in a patriotic zeal, so to speak, to join the, uh, the military services. Not there yet. We would like to think perhaps it might yet be, uh, but the, the statistical inferences are not there yet. Uh, I am always of the mind that uh, giving an adequate message and giving an adequate recruiting force will be okay on the recruiting side, but the military services bring people in at the bottom and grow their own, if you will, through the course of their military career. So it's the retention issue that is of great, great consequence to us. If I lose a, you know, a, a, a 12 or 13 year E6, uh, I don't bring one in uh, from the private sector overnight. I bring him in as a boot camp member and, and, and 10 years later, I've got a 10 year E6. Uh, so the retention piece on the military workforce is, uh, is an enormously important ingredient in our continued capacity to have the wherewithal to do what we're asking these people to do. Thank you. Well, I hope you communicate on behalf of those of us in Congress our pride in the workforce. I, I remember talking to one, um, I think it was the, the union uh, head of the customs group at uh, Champlain, and he, how he struggled with the question of when you have to work a double shift and you're there for 36 hours uh, or uh, incredible amounts of time they're working right now in, in INS and in, in Coast Guard and FBI, all kinds of people. Do you find that people slip through the border when you're at the end of your 36 hours that are different at the beginning? The pride said no. The exhaustion says, well, maybe, but I try not to let it happen. But every human being knows that if we, that, that the exhaustion and the uh, frustration that comes from that, that the pride and the enthusiasm are only going to carry us so far. And, and we're committed to trying to address this. And this committee is also going to stay focused on the fact that 1998, 18,000 people died of, of, of drug causes. And that uh, every day children are being beaten, spouses are being beaten, people are declaring bankruptcy. Anywhere from 70 to 85 percent of all crime in America is related to drugs. And we cannot back off a clear-cut, heavy pressure, constant pressure, chemical attack that's coming from narcotics because we fear about what else. In planning for the fears of what else, we have to have a perspective on what is actually there and not do the normal uh, political pressure, which is to respond to the urgency and then go, whoops. Uh, we have to focus as much as possible on both, and we need to, to work at the resources and the management levels to do that. I thank you all for coming and all your different agencies, and we'll look forward to continuing to work with you. With that, hearing stands adjourned.
Tomorrow morning, Attorney General John Ashcroft will update the Senate Judiciary Committee on federal law enforcement's anti-terrorism policies. You can see his testimony live on our companion network, C-SPAN 3, starting at 10 Eastern. And if the U.S. House of Representatives is done with business, you can also watch the hearing tomorrow night at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, on our other companion network, C-SPAN. C-SPAN 3 is a new channel that brings you even more of the quality public affairs programming that C-SPAN is known for. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, C-SPAN 3 is live, national politics and current events all week. U.S. history programs, nights and weekends. It's politics. It's history. It's C-SPAN 3. To get C-SPAN 3, call your local cable company or satellite provider. The C-SPAN Networks. Created as a public service for you by America's cable industry. Today we're at Fort Tyler in uh, West Point, Georgia, actually on the border between uh, West Point, Georgia and Lynette, Alabama, uh, where the Battle of West Point was fought uh, on Easter Sunday, 1865, April the 16th. Robert Charles Tyler was the uh, commanding general of the post at the time of the battle. Uh, he had been in the area for some months, uh, it's my understanding, convalescing from wounds that he had received at the Battle of Missionary Ridge earlier in the war. I had actually lost a leg, uh, but remained in the area and was assigned to the uh, post here as the fort commander. The purpose of the fort here was to uh, defend with its guns the bridges over the Chattahoochee River here which included a railroad bridge and also a wagon or foot bridge and the railroad itself which is a few blocks uh, here from the fort here. The fighting here actually uh, was a result of uh, federal cavalry troopers uh, under General Wilson, James Wilson, who had a large contingent of cavalry, about 13,000 men that moved over into this part of the state after fighting uh, a battle at Selma on April the 2nd against Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, shortly after